Okay, good morning, everyone. You have the recording. I do. Uh, so, thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Uh, you know, I'm excited. I think that we have a good cross section of people from different groups and different levels of their career, different backgrounds. So, we should be able to get some diverse perspectives to come out of this meeting. Uh, I think that, you know, for those of us in the room, we should acknowledge, you know, where we are here inside the Hudson River. I made sure to open up the blinds there. You know, we, we're in this beautiful space and it should be conducive for us. Let's come up with beautiful ideas, I hope. Uh, for those online, we wish you could be here. Uh, next time, we will be in the Hudson River tip. Uh, so I want, I want to start out with a code of conduct that has been uh, you know, proposed by the NASA Cops program, just for all of us, you know, many of the bullet points in this code of conduct are respecting one another, making sure that we're good listeners to each other's perspective. You know, we want to encourage people to listen as much as they speak. We want to always attempt to collaborate before conflict. You know, as I started out by pointing where we are, we want to be mindful of our surroundings and how our fellow participants may be perceiving something. You know, this afternoon when we talk about ethical considerations, obviously there could be some triggering issues that come up in that. So we just want to be aware of how what we say might impact others. Uh, I think you could you could sum this all up and say let's just be respectful of one another today. So I wanted to note also that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, you know, we do plan to take the artifacts of this meeting and post them on Zenodo or in another repository shortly after the, after the meeting ends. So if anyone has any issues with that, uh, you know, please speak to me privately about it. And we'll see what we can do to redact anything that we can do. Again, again, for those of you in the room, there are a couple of network options for wireless. They're, they're both open networks. So there's LDEO wireless and LDEO guest. For all offensive and purposes, they're, all, they're both good networks. But you know, if we get 20 people on one, maybe it'll slow down. You might try the other one. Uh, we have no passwords. You can just join these open networks. Just looking at our agenda at a glance. You know, I should have started out by saying my name is Kit McManus, but I think I know most of you in the room. So, or at least we've exchanged emails if you're coming today. Uh, you know, I'm a GIS developer here at Season, where I've been since 2007. I've uh, spent a lot of my effort working on the, the Socioeconomic Data and Applications Center project, or the NASA CDAP project, but I've also done some local research on flood impacts and, you know, Critical infrastructure and human impacts from flooding along the Hudson River or uh, along uh, the Jamaica Bay estuary. For those of you who flew into the area, flew over Jamaica Bay. Uh, our schedule, you know, we're going to start off this morning with an introduction from Alex Sherman. Uh, you know, our what's the word? Thank you. He's, he's the director of CEDA. Uh, Interim, interim director of season. I think we might get an appearance from Bob Chen at some point today, uh, who is our outgoing director at season. And, you know, we'll start off from 9.30 to 10.30, hearing from some folks from NASA uh, about some of the open source initiatives that have been going on. Uh, you know, then after the coffee break, we'll have a session where we hear about some pioneering work from other participants who have been working on open data, open tools, uh, you know, been working in the open science space for many years. In the afternoon, we're going to have a session where we get to look at some code. I uh, am thanks so much to Cassie, Josh, and Carl who's joining us remotely. Sorry. Demonstrating some of you know the, the cookbooks and the Jupyter notebooks that have been being developed to demystify this whole open science and the cloud issue that we're all facing. Uh, and then finally, we'll have some 
breakout sessions on you know the ethics of open source science, climate impacts and societal concerns, and then on open science education. So very ambitious agenda. You know, there's a lot really packed into this. Uh, admittedly, um, I'm not the best moderator at the time, so uh, you know, I'll rely on the community to help me with that and make sure everyone stays on time. I'll do my best to stay on time. I think that we can add that to the code of conduct. Give you about to stay on time. Uh, there will be a shuttle departing. You know, the same shuttle that many folks came in on this morning, part at 5 p.m. back to the Morningside campus. Uh, for those of you who may be local in the area or drove in, we, we will have an informal dinner later on tonight. Uh, location still to be determined, but there's a number of good restaurants in the area. So definitely want to extend that, that invitation. Uh, so, you know, we're talking, we're putting this meeting together about you know, the interactive component. Like for, for many of us in NASA, we go to these, these PI planning meetings for agile development. And they're, they're very interactive types of things where you know, people get up and they, they put things on boards. You know, in the academic setting, uh, you know, we think sometimes more like a traditional conference where you have a lecture format. But you know, we're aware that for people to actively learn, you can't just drone on and on in lectures. So, you know, so, you know, also I think something that the whole world is trying to figure out right now is this whole notion of hybrid meetings and how to make a hybrid meeting effective, how not to, you know, isolate people who are online and make them feel like they're not really, really participating. So I think one way to do that is to, to take our interactive sessions and to use technology to help so we have a meeting jam board set up for folks online or in person to log their thoughts. And you know, we have a page for each section. If you've never used Jamboard before, it's, it's pretty intuitive where you can click on a sticky note on the left, write something down, and then drag it into the section that makes the most sense for you. Uh, so we'll be taking time between sessions just to, to reflect and to you know write things up on the jam board. Yeah. Can, can yes. you just put a link to the jam board in the chat so that's like yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I'm an I'm an adjunct professor of spatial analysis and GIS. So it's nice to have other people actually contributing to the class when you're appearing, putting, putting stuff in the chat. I have to do that myself. Uh, but in the in the spirit of staying on time, you know, I'll pass the mic over to Alex Sherman and tell you a bit about what we we're hoping to do here today. Great. Uh, thanks, Kit. And a lot of credit goes to Kit and to Entromat for, for organizing this. I, I'm the deputy for deputy director of season and the and the manager for CDAC, a relatively recent all for me. As most of you may know, Bob Chen uh, will be visiting us later, has been the manager of CDAC for something like 25 years. You may be wondering, what is CDAC? CDAC basically uh, is a, one of 12 distributed active archive centers that are part of the NASA Earth Observation Data and Information System, so EOSPIS. Um, we're managed here at Season. You're visiting our lovely campus. The building from which we manage um, CDAC is over, actually called the Geoscience Building. Some of you will have a breakout over there later today. Uh, there's not a lot to see, to be honest. Uh, an old, uh, dated uh, 1970s style building needs some refurbishing, but it's uh, it's what we call home, and it's where our servers are and things like that. Um, we have staff uh, in social and natural sciences, a lot of GIS, uh, some remote sensing, data scientists, data management experts, uh, programmers, and system engineers to, to manage all of this. Um, the mission basically is this bridge mission between the earth and social sciences. Um, you know, NASA back in the 1990s, basically in what they called mission to planet earth, had this idea that just to provide remote sensing data alone would not be enough to really understand what's going on in the world. And that it would be valuable to provide a, an additional data center, namely CDAC, that provides the data that acts as a as a glue or integrator integrator across the earth and social sciences 
allows for some of these, um, you know, studies on human environment interactions. This was, remember, the time when everybody was studying deforestation in the Amazon, what's driving deforestation, and those sorts of questions were really at the core of a lot of, now it's a lot about climate change, right? Um, so there's shifts in focus, but basically CEDAC has continued to evolve as those shifts occur. We do a lot of bridging also to, uh, between the science community and the applied community and operational users and decision makers. Um, we've been working very actively with NASA on some of the environmental justice related concerns. Um, and so we also have these strong links to the geospatial community. So between the Group on Earth Observations or GEO, uh, Open Geospatial Consortium, which Greg has played a leadership role as well as KIT. Um, and we've had work with the uh, UN GGIM, which is a uh, kind of spatial data infrastructure group at the UN. We split ourselves into mission areas, just like NASA. So we have our own missions, but we don't send satellites into the sky. We have these five basic organizing frameworks. One is related to population and settlements. The next one is more of our climate related focus. We have a hazards related area. We have a population and food or poverty and food security. Um, kind of focus for some of our work. And then we have this, uh, this environmental sustainable development work, which often does things related to the indicators and the SDGs. Uh, so uh, composite indicators is one kind of data set that we carry in our collection. The top um, kind of these maps here show a lot of the data that we gather from census, survey, and other sources and compile into uh, kind of composite images of what's going on in the world, whether it's infant mortality or uh, GDP or um, uh, things like uh, age structure, all those things, of course, our flagship, which I'll get to in a second, is our population data. But we also carry certain uh, satellite data. Uh, these are DEMs and, and uh, data from the GRACE mission. We also have data that integrates satellite data along with the socioeconomic data. Um, many of you are familiar with our flagship product, which is the gridded population of the world. Uh, it started, actually, I have the privilege to be at one of the inception workshops in Saginaw, Michigan, back when Season was an independent NGO. And uh, they were designing this product to basically grid uh, all the census data in the world. At that time, they only had 19,000 administrative units. Now we have more than 12 million, and I imagine the next iteration of GPW version 5 will have even more. And this is uh, the image that most of you are familiar with, the GPW. This is really a base data layer that's used in many of the other products that are out there, like uh, World Pop, um, um, uh, GHS Pop, et cetera. So we were privileged to work with a lot of partners as well, Facebook, HRSL, um, in, in kind of providing those input census layers that are then modeled using various other inputs. Um, this is a product that Greg, uh, sorry, Kit worked very, very uh, intensely on. And, uh, you know, in the old days, what we do is we provide one estimate with one population layer, one digital elevation model, and one urban layer, and basically say, this is the number of people that are going to be inundated potentially at different inundation levels or sea level rise levels. Um, you know, in this new approach, we basically use three different, four different population inputs. We use uh, three different DEMs, and we use different uh, characterization of urban to kind of characterize the populations that are in those uh, kind of at-risk areas in the low elevation co coastal zone. Uh, this is a product that Cascade Tucholsky, one of our former postdocs, produced. Uh, I think Andrew Zimmer is planning to be online today, and maybe, maybe Cascade will make an appearance. But he's been working very extensively on exposure to heat extremes. So this is heat and humidity. And it basically is a grid that allows you to say how many times over the last 30 or so years has a, a pixel been exposed to temperatures in excess of certain thresholds. Um, this is a product that I work very closely on, which is the groundswell uh, climate migration scenarios. But what we did is essentially, you know, project future population under climate change scenarios. So we took uh, changes in crop production, water availability, and sea level rise, essentially in a gravity model working with Brian Jones at CUNY uh, to essentially model future population under climate impacts. And then we compared that to models that don't include climate impacts. And when you do that, you can actually back out migration models. Um, and then we also produce a data set, uh, well, actually we disseminate a number of data sets that are 
or curate, I will call it, uh, data sets that are produced by third parties. So this is a, a very widely used data set on the top that's um, now we're actually going to be distributing the next version. And that one basically looks at global particulate matter distribution. We also have nitrogen dioxide and some other metrics like ozone. Um, and the, the map basically shows in shades of green areas that are getting cleaner and in shades of purple areas that are getting, I would say, more polluted over time with particulate matter. The bottom half is basically a collection that Xiaoxi Ling, who's in the room here, uh, has curated from Harvard, and it's all U.S. based, but multiple contaminants and basic or air pollutants and basically at different spatial resolutions and including one that summarizes the data at zip code level. Um, Carolyn Hallquist and, and uh, Susanna Adamo worked on this product, which basically gridded the social vulnerability index data, makes them available for various spatial analyses and data integration. And then you can combine those with things like climate risk, which is from a NASA co uh, colleagues at Goddard Space Flight Center, which projects uh, climate risk into the future. The last data product, which some of you picked up the, uh, the little lens cleaner. If you didn't get one, there's still more. Uh, the lens cleaner shows a, a global graded relative deprivation index. Uh, Juan Martinez, who's over here, uh, led the development of that. We, you know, with a team of people kind of contributing. It was a realization that for the first time ever, we could gather subnational data on poverty and other characteristics of population for socioeconomic data, combine them with satellite data, and actually produce a, an output. I'm glad to say that the first. Uh, one of the first citations we have that data set is here in a nature publication. So it's already proving to be useful. And working with some interns from Lehman College at CUNY, we're going to be doing uh, validation work and actually doing a version two of that data product soon. Um, common practices in human environment research. So these are all things you're familiar with. You're all experts in this area. They're often very labor intensive. All the pre-processing that's required to get your data in a kind of format that's ready to be to produce that final publication or policy relevant results. All of these things can be aided by open science. So this is our purpose of this workshop is basically to bring the experts together, the people who are here, you in other words, and really talk through what needs to be done to make this work go more easily in the future and how can CDAC assist in that. Um, this is a kind of typology of, of application areas that I developed a few years ago for a publication where we were just looking at, you know, what is the evidence for the use of our NASA, our CDAC, sorry, a pretty population of the world in conjunction with other earth science data. I'm not going to go through this, but basically there's kind of typologies and many of you could think of additional categories of, of application as well. And as the number of socioeconomic gridded and other data sets are, that are available out there grow, uh, it provides a lot of opportunities. Just a shout out there to say that we've been active in this open science space over the last year, doing a lot of things through different uh, activities. Kip's going to talk more about school. Uh, Rob Bob Chen and, and Bob Downs, who's online, I believe, uh, he's our senior digital archivist, and he's been very active in the open data space from the policy side and from the data management side. All of these things need to come together. It's not just the open tools, but it's also the, uh, the data policy and, and kind of back end um, data management that needs to be uh, changed. Um, and then we've got also, uh, you know, Susanna Adamo here as well, who was involved in some work with IAI in this last uh, period. We have a GitHub repository. It's small, it's going to grow. We want to put all of our code for development of certain data sets like GPW out there as open. Uh, and then the Dante project was what, something we work with with where's Tom Paris uh, and Josh Brinks. John, Josh, raise your hand, and you'll be hearing more from Josh later. But basically, uh, it was an effort to develop vignettes and snippets and code and basically uh, provide an access point for a lot of the tools that people like you need to use in order to better integrate data from the social sciences and earth sciences. And then, of course, we have today's workshop. Why are we doing this? One is that NASA's put a huge emphasis on TOPS. We're going to hear a lot more about TOPS, so I won't say more about that now. The other is that we recently updated our strategic plan, and our fourth strategic objective is basically to enhance existing tools and services and create new ones in support of open science, open source science, and cloud-based user access analysis and applications. 
NASA has made a, a huge priority out of, of getting all of its data into the cloud. So we're working very closely with NASA colleagues to get our CDAC data also in the cloud so that everything will be in a cloud compatible form in cloud compatible formats. And there's a need to better understand what your needs are. So we want to hear from you. If there's sticky notes that you want to put up there that say, I, you know, you guys are doing a you know a B minus job on this or that or whatever, feel free. We want to hear from you. And then we'd like to make this an opportunity for all, all of you to hear from one another. Um, these are some of the topics. I think this is not new to you, so I'm not going to go into this. But what we um, want to say is that we're planning a report. So if you put stuff on the jam board or if you, you know, contribute actively, it's all going to go into a report. There will be some note takers who are designated and they'll be taking notes on, um, on sessions here. And then um, we hope to integrate some of the things that we learn about today into future modules uh, for curriculum online. And, and sort of these webinar style, uh, RSID is the Advanced Re Remote Sensing Education and Training, I think, program at NASA. And then finally, uh, we may have follow-on workshops. We may do some more of these where we're really drilling down into separate other topics. I want to quickly acknowledge the UWG, the User Working Group of CDAC, which has been really instrumental in helping us think through how to put this together, who to invite, how to go about it. And so some of these people, Sarah Kern is in the, in the room, Nita, unfortunately was exposed to COVID. Hopefully she's not got COVID, but she's decided wisely to stay home, uh, but she was gonna be here. And then there's another number of other people who hopefully will be joining us online today, including Dan Runkle, who's a presenter. Um, we have others who are former UWG members who've joined us today. And also I wanna acknowledge our NASA collaborators and, and the staff who are joining today. There are many other NASA collaborators who we could thank and acknowledge, but those are the ones that I want to acknowledge. And then lastly, of course, our speakers. We really appreciate the time that you put into um, compiling. So compiling presentations. So at this point, and I hope I um, left enough time. We're good. Um, so I'll, I think you know who I am. Uh, and my institutional affiliation, what I'll say is that I'm really interested in hearing from all of you in the room about Open, you know, open science tools and approaches. So I'll be listening very attentively. And so with that, Kit, if you want to say again your name and we'll go around the circle and then go on. Sure, you heard from me. Oh, hi everyone. My name is Antoinette Wanabo. I'm here with um, CDAC and I've corresponded with a number of you um, over email. I'm particularly interested in open science because I think that it's an opportunity to use tools to advance many different fields of research and it is essentially the future, I think. Hello, everybody. My name is Ryan Mead. I am with Binghamton University's Educational Opportunity Program. Uh, my focus is on diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher ed. That's why I'm interested in speaking. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalia Bermudez. I'm an Inter-American Associate from Capacity Building from NASA. And I work for a lot of networks in the Americas, like Virgil, Geo, and that we're trying to bring this kind of technologies to the outside line. So this is kind of interesting to learn more about these tools. I am Rob Quick. I am the director of the Cyber Infrastructure Integration Research Center at Indiana University. Um, I'm here because I uh, founded a program that it teaches uh, foundational data science concepts to um, uh, initially low and middle income country students from low and middle income countries. Um, and we're moving it now from an international program to a US based program that will focus on minority serving institutions. Hi, I'm Rosanna Neuhausler. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley in the geography department. I am here and care about open science just to you know, open the conversation since a lot of these um, places that we study through satellite data, right? Like, just to kind of have that dialogue be more present and available. Hi, my name's Bree. Um, I'm here uh, to talk about open science. Um, and as part of my role at the NASA Land Processes, essentially data library, um, I have a background in remote sensing and ecology. And I'm really excited to kind of experience and help other people see the value in collaborating across different disciplines and finding connections where they're unexpected. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Juan Martinez. Um, I'm with CSEN and CDEC. 
I'm a senior research assistant here. Uh, and the reason why I'm here is to learn more about how to uh, increase access to all these great data sets that, that we all produce and how to translate that into some more uh, action uh, and understanding for, for more people. Hi, um, I'm Elaine. I'm a research associate at Baruch College, um, and I'm interested in open science because um, I know how hard it can be to like process um, that type of information, um, especially as someone who um, was a beginner at some point. So I think it's important to make um, these data sets available for everyone. Hi, my name is Josh Briggs. I'm a research scientist <clears throat> at uh, iSciences, a private firm, and I'm here on behalf of the Kit and Greg's Top School Initiative. And um, I've got a pretty good history of open science and really into kind of maybe not demystifying, but taking published research methods and kind of making them accessible and, and putting them in packages, publishing it um, on uh, R and other grand art and stuff like that. And I've also got a pretty good history in uh, citizen science and teaching science for non site students and non students at all, stuff like that. So, really big and open science class programming. I'm Tom Paris. I'm president of a small, sometimes profitable consulting company uh, called iSciences. Um, I'm also a member of the CDEC UWG, um, been collaborating with season. Uh, in some cases as an employee many, many decades ago, uh, but uh, over the years on a number of different projects. Um, Alex mentioned the uh, Dante project. We're also involved as a subcontractor with the top school initiative. Um, I'm interested in open science for a lot of reasons, so I'll pick one. Um, for a stretch of my career, I was uh, Harvard's first environment library. And out of that experience, I'm interested in open science as a tool for democracy, um, which I think, uh, and demystifying expertise uh, in ways that are accessible for political discourse. Hey everyone, I'm Cassie Nichols. I'm at Kodak, which is the Oceanography Data Center at NASA. Um, and I'm really excited to be here because I love collaboration. It's my job. Like when I people ask, what's your job? Like it's my job to make complicated things simple. And I think that's what open science does really well. So I'm excited to collaborate with y'all. I'm Sarah Curran, I'm like Tom. I'm a member of the user group at CDAC and delighted to be here. Uh, looking forward to learning a lot. Um, I wear a number of different hats. So I am currently the director of our demography center at the University of Washington. And I'm also associate vice provost for research at the University of Washington. And we're currently, we're struggling with thinking about open scholarship and how we can you know, support it more broadly at the university. I'm the university's representative for the Higher Education Leadership Initiative for Open Scholarship. And um, so I'm interested in the broader issues as well as the very specific ones around how do we collaborate and integrate data. So glad to be here. I'm Jenny Houston. I'm with NASA's Data Science Data and Information System Project, or EDSIS. And uh, I'm particularly interested to see uh, how what we discuss here can be uh, leveraged across multiple that recognized purposes that are CDAC driven. Uh, I'm James Milburn. I'm the software engineering manager at Alaska Satellite Facility, which is the SARDAC. Um, I'm here mainly to see how we can facilitate and contribute to open science. We've done a lot of open source stuff, open science is kind of new, and we want to be part of things like you mentioned, you know, shared tools. Everybody de develops their own converters for geostats, whatever, and, and how do we part of the community doing that for everyone? Hi, I'm Greg Allen. I'm an associate director for geospatial applications at Stephen. While I'm working on CDAC, I'm involved in kids' talk school Good project. And, uh, I work, <laughs> and I work on a number of uh, data development uh, projects and teach uh, some uh, data analysis, of course. So I'm interested in the process of all those things. I'm Andrea Gahn. I'm a 
it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a professor at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. Uh, and I've also worked on and off the season and world pop and the heritage population world. Uh, and I've also been involved in different projects that are associated with looking and studying human environment systems. And so I was super curious to come be part of this, grateful for the invitation. Uh, because that intersection of grappling with how you collect the data, how you translate that, how you process, process that data, and how you make that data available, and at what level of, like what, what's the foundation or the knowledge base that other people need to be able to update and use that data, I think that's all great honor for discussion. So it seems like a nice group, but yeah, that's not So we're going to go to the back row. Be brief because we still have quite a number of people to get through online. And so, uh, Hello, speak up. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I am Navi. I am a student at Columbia Climate School doing my master's in climate and society and associated with the uh, season as a research assistant. And I'm interested to learn all uh, about the open science from the diversity of background, which are coming to this workshop to learn how we can use, utilize the uh, research data. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn Montquist. I'm a former season postdoc and now adjunct lecturer at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. And I'll be talking more about what I care about with open science in a bit, but I'll pass it on to Shane. <laughs> yeah, Charles Pichin, uh, information scientist of season, um, also a colleague of uh, IPCC Data Distribution Center. Uh, see that post part of it, and NASA has supported this. Uh, BBC for decades. I'm here. Uh, IPC is moving more and more about uh, open data for open science. And actually, NASA is coming to the uh, IR7 and uh, working with this week. Hi, I'm Linda I'm Linda Vasilezi. I'm a GIS specialist at CSEN um, and uh, work on CDEF as well. And I'm part of the NASA TOPS project that we'll hear about later. I'm fairly new to open science. Um, I think what appeals to me about it and what I'm interested in is that as a data user, um, I've often encountered issues where there's very little documentation about how the data set was produced or, uh, you know, just struggling to figure out, um, you know, the context and for, for how the data was produced. I find that the methods are usually sparse and not uh, fully documented. Um, as a data provider, I'm also interested in the open science uh, aspect of accessibility and making data accessible, you know, to users of all skill levels. Um, so, yeah, I can close with Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Joseph Martin. I am a research staff at the Defense Season. Um, I'm also involved in the top school program. And I'm interested in open science and how it increases accessibility. Um, and I'm just excited to learn more about this more. I think I'm going to go off. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamila Green. I'm also a research staff assistant at Season. Um, I'm also working on this top school project. And I'm really excited to hear about I've learned open science practices and how we can better incorporate them into our project. Uh, I'm Kelly Gallimore. I'm a professor at Lafayette College. And uh, I'm here primarily because I'm uh, heavy user of open data sets for deforestation and stuff, and also because I'd like to incorporate more cloud-based stuff into some of my classes. Uh, hello, I'm Jaffor. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Georgetown University, and my interest for open science is because I believe that open science opens the door of ideas, innovation, and collaboration. Um, hi, I'm Iris Tano, and I'm a research associate for Baruch College, and I have a background in geospatial data. I'm interested in open science because I'd like to see how it can be leveraged to make an impact in people's lives. Good morning, my name is Dana Thompson. I am uh, recently joined NISA as Associate Director of Science Application. Impact is something that I care a lot about, it's collaboration. I think that open science is a great vehicle for um, Making data that's relevant and, um, and accurate on dynamic phenomena, things that are, are constantly changing. And I think it's also a great vehicle for uh, co design, co production, and, and in the process of that equity building it. Hi, everybody. My name is Ashimi Gates. I'm a GIS specialist at the City Center. I want to work on the tree, but I am not sure. 
I am Rafael Ramos. I'm affiliated with uh, Brazil's National Institute for Space Research. Uh, I do geospatial research in its applications at the urban, uh, social, and environmental applications. I guess my interest in open science is both accessibility of uh, data and tools, but also more transparency and, and understanding uh, reliability of uh, these tools in terms of the lack of data accuracy. Uh, and hello, my name is Susana Adamo. I am a research scientist and also a research scientist for CIDAC. I am a developer, but I am interested in open science because of the potential for open data, but also for access to knowledge and development decisions. Great. Um, so now we're going to turn to online. This has been really helpful, by the way. And so uh, what I'm going to ask is, is you, if you're available to or able to um, show yourself on video, to go ahead and do that and introduce yourself. And hopefully whoever's speaking will show up in the main window here so we can all get a good look at you, as it, as it were. So uh, Andrew Zimmer, if you, do, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Sure thing. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, my name is Andy Zimmer. I'm a research scientist at Montana State University. Um, I work with Carolyn Holquist to introduce herself before, and, and we're going to talk um, a little bit later this morning uh, about some of our work uh, with an open science project as kind of an example. I'm excited to be here and, and learn from you all, too. Uh, Arlette Lasso. Good morning. I am Alex Simofoto. I'm joining from Paris region. I am a research scientist at the French National Institute for Demographic Studies. I'm interested in open science because I am more and more interested by remote sensing data to link it to population data. And I think it's a great way to know what is out. And also it's a way, to, an opportunity to speed up the research process. Excellent. Uh, ben Stewart. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Benjamin Stewart. I'm a senior geographer at the World Bank. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I was planning on it, but got a little uh, got a little sick this weekend, so I didn't join. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested in open science. I, I manage the World Bank's organizational GitHub, and our team at the bank provides, develops tools uh, for, for use in, in our developing countries and our, our client countries. So I'm really interested in sort of the capacity building aspect a lot of, of a lot of these open science tools. Thanks a lot. Cascade to all yeah, so uh, I'm Cascade Jolski. I'm an assistant professor at Montana State University um, and formerly a seasoned postdoc. And I'm really excited to participate in this workshop. Um, I'm particularly interested as somebody who every line of code I've ever written was taken from Stack Overflow in terms of taking that kind of open coding paradigm to the next level with open science um, and the interoperability between open source uh, coding libraries and data sets, particularly to teach new students um, and also to reduce uncertainty in the work we all do to show what we are doing and the uncertainty uh, around that kind of work. So thank you. Great, thanks, Dan Runfola, who's a member of RUWG. Hi there, I'm Dan Runfola. Wear a lot of different hats. I'm our associate director here for our data science program and the director of our graduate program. Um, I sit on the UWG, as, as Alex just mentioned. Most of the reason I am interested in open data is far less lofty than, than all of you. It's because I was looking for data and I couldn't find it. And here I am 10 years later maintaining uh, some of the larger databases. So uh, that's that's my role. Look forward to chatting to you guys later. Thanks. Uh, David uh, Van Riper, uh, also UWG member. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Van Riper. I'm the Director of Spatial Analysis at IPAMS at the University of Minnesota and a member of the UWG. And here at IPAMS, we uh, collect, harmonize, and disseminate uh, massive volumes of census microdata uh, and small area census data from all over the world, both from now uh, going into the past. And we're very interested in open data, open science, and getting our data in the hands of all of you to kind of supercharge your research. Data tank. Oh, I think you will. Okay, we are available. Uh, Dennis Sangha. Okay, uh, I'm Dennis Sangha. Uh, I, I am following from Cameroon uh, in C4, working uh, for C4, Center for International Forestry Research. It's true that I work mainly, I will say, at the local level, but sometimes having students 
PhD student that work uh, outside the national or global level. So, so I, I'm here really to be more acquainted with, with, the, with the process of uh, uh, open science data uh, and so on. So thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Gabriela? Yeah, Okay, truly international participation, which is great. I'm sure that Rima is available. Aliyah? Aliyah Machado? Yes, I'm here. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Earth, Environmental and Geospatial Sciences. And uh, we also collaborate with uh, CISIN through an internship program with uh, Professor Gorokovic. Thanks. Elizabeth Joyner, Massive. Good morning, everyone. And I wanna thank you, Alex and Kit and the whole CDAC team for making our virtual participation possible. That's really important, um, especially for open science. Um, so I'm the community coordinator for Earth Science Data Systems, and I am here to learn from you all. Um, but probably um, my goal is that, I, stated simply, I want to be a catalyst for data democratization. And I want to better support all data users, no matter where they fall on the data fluency or the data dexterity side. So I'm, I've got an ear bent towards that. So thank you for having me today. Thank you. Uh, Felipe Montalegre. Hi, um, I just noticed also Ebrima was available, but like muted. I'm not sure if, if you want to yeah. go. Uh... Okay. Yes, I'm I'm Ibrima K C C. I'm I'm a Dr. C C University of the Gambia. I lecture econometrics, MSc students, and I also in the summer I directly have courses on data analysis tools, Stata, R, EView, and SPSS, and research and methodology development. So uh, I lecture both BSc and MSc students, mostly in forecasting and also in econometrics too. Okay, I want to learn more because in my thesis, I have uh, like a vulnerability. So I, I want to understand mapping using GIS, especially to understand vulnerability in different regions, especially in the rural Gambia. Okay, nice to meet you. I want to learn more. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I'm Felipe Montalegre. I'm a postdoc in uh, environmental science in UC Berkeley. Um, we'll be actually like talking about our open science uh, project later on. But like uh, my background is in physics, so I kind of like know firsthand, you know, how like useful it is like coming into a new field, especially fields that are, you know, multidisciplinary. Um, you know how 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 easier life is if things are you know like open like open science based um so i'm very excited to learn more about open science and about how people are using it okay uh, joel scott hey there i'm joel scott i'm a program executive for earth science data systems at nasa headquarters um, and i believe that the work cdac does bringing together socioeconomic data with geospatial data is really important so i'm excited to see how open science can enhance and advance the work that you all do thanks for having me Thanks, Joel. Appreciate your coming. Um, uh, back to James Gibson, if you're available, to just say we're about who you are. Hey, I'm James Gibson. I'm a senior research staff assistant at uh, Season. Yep. Thanks. Uh, I think Juan's in the room. Uh, Julia, Julia Lounge. Hey, everybody. I'm Julia Lounge. I'm excited to be here to learn with you all. Um, I lead OpenScapes and co-lead the NASA OpenScapes project with Aaron Robinson. And through that project, we're working currently with 11 of the data centers across NASA and supporting researchers transitioning their workflows to the cloud. And open science is a huge part of that. Um, I personally am really excited about open science, not only for the um, promise that it provides with tools and data, but also to make science less lonely um, and kinder. So that's what really brings me to open science. Thanks so much. Lisa Lukang. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Lukang. I work with CSIN on the Grid3 and um, CDAC projects. I'm here because I want to learn more about open science, how it can help us with our work, and how we can help our users too. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mona Hamad. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mona Hamachi, and I'm a postdoc at Lamont. And uh, I'm here today to understand how all of this science can be used on tropical cyclone risk assessment uh, and understanding the vulnerability of developing countries um, to uh, these hazards. Thank you so much. Nancy Searby of NASA. She's our program scientist on CDEC. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. It's really great to hear such a great, uh, diverse group of expertise. I can't wait to learn from you all. Um, so yeah, Nancy Serby, CDAC program scientist, also manage the NASA headquarters Earth Action Capacity Building Program, including RSET development in Severe and Indigenous Peoples and Prices and Challenges. And so I really resonate with the, the capacity building part. And also, I think as I think about Oakland science, the equitable aspect, completely in every country, not just the United States, not just the well-off countries, but every country, and also the enabling infrastructure aspects of that and making sure that everybody can participate in this kinder world. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Nikita. Hi, I'm Nikita and I work for Ecotech Futures, which is based in Chicago. And uh, we develop platforms or toolkits to allow people to make on the ground decisions for um, civic challenges to so civil society mainly. Thank you. Nita Barty, who's a UWD member as well. Hi, I'm Nita Barty. I'm Associate Professor at Penn State University in the Department of Biology and the Center for Infectious uh, Disease Dynamics. And I'm interested in open science because early on I realized that most of the interdisciplinary research progress that we make is due to um, data sharing agreements between people with good connections and open science has the promise of making those connections available to everybody. Paula Blanco. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Paula Kim Blanco. I lead the GRID3 project at CSUN. Um, GRID3 is an applied um, science project. We support African countries and we developed open data sets. And so very interested in learning more about the open science workflows. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Downs, CSUN. Uh, yes, thanks, Alex. And uh, yeah, I'm Bob Downs and I am the co- project scientist at at uh, CDAC with uh, Susanna Adamo. And uh, I'm sorry to not be there in, in person, but I'm actually in isolation. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the uh, open science offers an opportunity for us to increase the value and impact of science across society. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Roman Hoffman, Piazza. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Hi, everyone. I'm Roman Hoffman. I'm connecting from Vienna today. I'm a research group leader of the Migration and Sustainable Development Research Group at IASA. Um, and our work focuses on integrating large-scale environmental and population data sets. And open science is increasingly important for us, both as users of uh, open science data sets as well as producers. And I'm interested in learning more about different open science applications, as well as seeing, find, uh, seeing ways how to more effectively use open science in our day-to-day -day work. Thank you for the invitations. Thank you. Steve Crawford. NASA. Steve Crawford. I'm the uh, lead for the Open Source Science Initiative, and I'll be talking more about open science shortly. Great, thanks. Sydney Nugabauer. Uh, Bauer. Hello, everybody. Sydney Nugabauer. I work at NASA's Capacity Building Program alongside Nancy Searby. I'm excited to be here today because open science has always been part of our ethos, and I'm excited to see how we can make that more accessible and also just talking about it, bringing it into the language and doing the work. Thank you. Thank you. Zainab? Hello, everyone. I'm Zainab Shakruwal. I'm currently pursuing my master's in data science from Columbia University. And as a student, open science and open data especially helps me a lot when I'm trying to find answers to questions or creating projects or trying to analyze or understand a data. Thank you. Um, I think John Squire, if you want to say hello. Hi, um, I'm John Squires. I'm a uh, GIS specialist at CSUN, and I'm here to uh, see how I can uh, integrate better with the open science community. Great, thanks. Is there anyone online who we missed? Yes. <clears throat> Hi everybody, <clears throat> I'm I'm Yuri Yuri Gorokovich from Lehman College. 
So we work on a project, a uh, joint project with Season, um, with a few students. And I'm interested also in uh, application open science and open data in our teaching and research, so. Great, thanks. David Jones, also former UWG member. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this is Dave Jones. I'm the president and CEO of Storm Center Communications. And um, I'm here today because uh, we do a lot of work with NASA. We work with NOAA uh, to put more data to work to support decision makers in real in a real-time collaborative environment. So we've uh, uh, not only have I been on the CDAC UWG, but we've worked with CDAC uh, to enable some data services uh, regarding socioeconomic uh, information uh, in a real-time collaborative environment through GeoCollaborate. So it's always a pleasure to participate in, uh, in these activities and particularly this workshop. So uh, sorry I'm, I was late, but uh, thanks for inviting me for this. Thanks, Dave. Um, and I'll just give Dave Tang one more chance if he's available. Otherwise, um, I do think it was worth going through this because it gives a really good flavor. I love some of the comments that uh, open science is collaborative. It's, it's, uh, it brings that human element to the work, um, compassionate, et cetera. So I'm excited, and I think we're going to have to move on to the next segment. So I'm going to pass the baton back to Kit. Yeah, I'll let you know. have David Tan introduce himself in the chat. Fine. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sonata. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're already off time, but, you know, if there's any reason to go off time, I think that was a good reason. I couldn't help but feel good hearing from everyone and on such a diverse group of participants that are here today. Uh, so, you know, we're going to break break the rule and go off time. Uh, that, that was a worthwhile reason to do it. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Crawford from NASA. He gave himself a brief introduction as well. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about NASA's open science initiatives. Uh, Dr. Crawford had to join from the phone today, so I'll recording the slides. So Dr. Crawford, please take it away and just let me know when you want to advance the slide. Thank you very much, Kit. And thank you everyone for uh, uh, having me here today. Um, I'm really happy to join. Um, it's really great to see this types of meetings. Uh, this is, uh, looking at the agenda, I'm, I'm really sorry I can't join for the full day uh, because it just, it, seems like the exact thing that we're hoping to see and the exact conversations we hope to see uh, from NASA and our overall uh, open science efforts. Um, and uh, since we're already behind time, we'll, we'll jump right in. Um, as I said in the introduction, I'm Steve Crawford. I'm part of the Office of the Chief Science Data Officer, and I am the lead for the Open Source Science Initiative. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, last year, as probably many of you know, the White House announced 2023 as a year of open science. Uh, we're now past 2023, and so we, we've we started to like to say we're entering an era of open science. Um, but across the federal government, um, the U.S. federal government has adopted open science and the principles of open science. We've had some great highlights from last year, from releasing our open science guidance for researchers, our updated NASA's plan for public access, and uh, some other things I'll be also talking further about, like our TOPS OS 101 curriculum and our release of the Science Explorer. If you go to the next slide, one of the things I think was actually uh, one of the great things from doing the um, uh, release of the, the uh, whoop, uh, if you go back one, okay, nope, go ahead. Um, part of the um, open science uh, year of open science is definition of open science, which is the principles and practices of making research products and processes available to all while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy and fostering collaborations, reproducibility and equity. And as part of that, NASA is trying to make, and, and, and one of the things that we, we love about open science is, and things that many of you mentioned was making science accessible, reproducible and inclusive. We know when we do that, it creates research which is cited more, has a bigger impact, increases transparency, and is more inclusive. And inclusive science means projects which uh, are more collaborative, access to hidden knowledge, um, the things that aren't always shared in papers and publications, more equitable systems, and increased participation. 
especially by those who are most affected by the science which is being done, by the communities and by the different groups uh, which are impacted by this. As part of this, and on uh, the next slide, uh, one of the things that we've done here at NASA is introduce NASA's Open Source Science Initiative to, to help actually implement open science across the Earth and space science communities. And we're doing this through four different um, focuses uh, on evolution, infrastructure, incentives, and community. Now I'll go through and talk about some of these different um, aspects as we go to the next slide. And so one of the first things that we did was update NASA's scientific information policy. Um, these were based on both community input, updated federal guidance, uh, and additional um, inputs, uh, including National Academy studies, um, to update how we share the scientific information which is produced from NASA funding. Uh, some of the major policy updates include that peer-reviewed publications are made openly available with no embargo period that our research data and software are shared at the time of publication or the end of the funding award, that our mission data are released as soon as possible and un unrestricted mission software is developed openly, and that science workshops and meetings are held openly to enable broad participation. And I think this meeting with its uh, hybrid participation and, and sharing of material is a great example of that. Um, but with the policy updates, which are actually being applied uh, starting in ROSES 23, uh, our, our solicitations starting in the past year, um, that we really do hope that the scientific information being produced uh, by our awards and by our research are shared as openly as possible um, while maintaining things like privacy, security restrictions, or other concerns that you may want to actually uh, limit the sharing of information. Um, but once you actually are able and, and should share it openly, that information is shared as openly as possible. Um, to help actually onboard people, and, and because many of these different aspects are, are new to people, uh, one of the things that we have introduced is our uh, Open Science 101 training as part of our Transformed Open Science effort. And on the next slide, um, you know, we talk more about TOPS, which is a five-year mission to accelerate adoption of open science. Its goals are to increase understanding and adoption of open science principles and techniques, broaden participation by historically excluded communities, and Alex accelerate scientific discovery. As part of this, we've released Open Science 101, which is a community-developed introduction to core open science skills. Uh, this includes five modules uh, looking at uh, both the ethos of open science, results from open science, uh, open data, open code, uh, and open tools as well. Uh, these five modules are now all openly accessible on a, a online learning platform and also will be available uh, through different virtual schools uh, and in-person schools uh, throughout the year. Um, if you take the course and complete all five modules, um, and they're all available on an a, a online learning platform, um, you do receive a NASA Open Science uh, badge um, as part of that process. And even for those who have um, uh, maybe experts in one area or another, you can pass pass out of it. But I think even for experts, there's so much to actually learn in this course. There's so many great contributions from a wide ranging community uh, that even someone who's uh, an expert in open science uh, will still learn plenty by taking a look at it. Um, overall, the, the courses are designed to be about um, two hours each. Uh, and so uh, I really do encourage people to please check this out and uh, take an opportunity to learn more uh, about open science. Um, but the curriculum is only uh, one of the many different things that we're, we're doing, and I wanted to touch on some of the other areas. And so if we go to the next slide, um, one of the other areas that we are focused on is expanding data science. Um, and this is an example of some of the work which is being done, which is with foundational AI models. Um, these have been uh, pre-trained on NASA uh, Landsat Sentinel data um, and can be used for multiple different tasks um, actually to actually take a look at different um, uh, different types of um, Dr. Crocker, are you there? Excuse me, so long. Oh, oh, we, oh we lost your, you're back now. Okay. 
Steve, can uh, you hear me? Um, I'll, I'll go back to, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, I'll start from the slide again. Um, one of the things that we've been uh, supporting is data science efforts, including um, on foundational AI models. Uh, these are one example that has been recently released in partnership with IBM is a model based on our uh, Landsat Sentinel-2 data sets um, that can be used with a range of different sources. Um, these are made openly available at Hugging Face, um, including the models, data sets, and codes. Um, these are uh, generative models that can be actually used for a range of different uh, activities. And so uh, something to also look at at building on in terms of um, different projects, or if you're interested in uh, further projects of this type, it's something that we're interested in, in hearing about and supporting. If you go to the next slide, one of the things that we've uh, just released uh, last month is the Science Explorer. Uh, this is a literature-based open digital platform uh, covering the fields of astrophysics, planetary science, heliophysics, earth science, and NASA space-based experiments. Um, it can be used to identify um, a, a range of different publications. Uh, it's, a, it's based on the Astrophysics Data Service, which has been um, used in astronomy for over 30 years for searching for publications. Uh, and we've recently expanded it to the other fields. Um, and so this is a a, a new tool for searching um, the literature uh, and providing connections both to the literature and to existing data sets. Um, if you go to the next slide, we also have a wide range of data that we've made available on AWS as public data. I know um, some of the upcoming talks will be talking about a lot of the cloud-based earth data, which is available. And so I wanted to uh, just mention one another source um, for public data. Uh, that we've made freely available in the cloud is a, a wide range of data sets um, which are made available as part of the registry of open data on AWS. Uh, we can also, um, if you have data sets which um, don't fit into a, a current DAC or um, uh, but would be of wide interest to the public, it's something that we, we would be interested in discussing about hosting as part of the um, NASA public data sets on, on AWS. Um, but there's also a wide range of different support which is coming for actually using this data and different services in the cloud for uh, making use of these. Um, and on the next slide, I have some examples of those. Um, you know, as we actually grow and our data sets are becoming larger and larger and, and more diverse uh, and more complex, um, one of the things that we have been looking at is looking at providing different um, cloud-based services to actually help access that data and make it available. Um, some non-Earth science examples are Helio Cloud and GeneLab, um, but then some Earth-based examples are the VEDA project and the Earth Observing Dashboard. Um, and I think um, these provide, uh, and, and as we look at making the data more accessible, um, it's not just actually making the data available, but also providing ways for people to access the data uh, and the computing in order to answer the questions that they have. Um, there's also a number of community-based efforts um, that are presented in the next slide. Um, and I know Julia will be uh, talking further about, uh, Julia and Bree, and um, I think another number of people will be talking further about OpenScapes later today, um, but there's also projects like MyBinder, um, which provide access to computing in the cloud. Uh, Kit will be talking about their efforts to provide further training on uh, uh, science curriculum as part of the TOPS program and, and the school project. Um, but there's also great projects like GMAP uh, and, and Kushung Wo's work at providing tutorials online for how people use open source software uh, to do further analysis of earth and spatial data. Uh, and we've also put out um, the supplement for open source science awards uh, which does provide support for cloud-based um, uh, access uh, and studies. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit further about that at the end. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, um, but we know across NASA and, and across our wide range of different sources uh, that our, you know, there are different needs for data and computing services to enable open science. 
And so one of our biggest efforts in the, the upcoming year is our core data and computing services. Um, this is uh, taking a look at how SMB will provide computing, cloud computing infrastructure that enables our different SMB divisions to perform a wide range of different activities from data stewardship to research and uh, reduce the need for duplicative infrastructure efforts. Um, the program aims to accomplish this through uh, our core services uh, project office, which will offer standardization archi and architecture um, to our different divisions. And um, this will be a wide range of different services that we'll be looking to help support um, to make our data and our uh, computing more accessible, uh, but also increasing things like um, how we manage uh, our, our overall identity management and security as well. Um, and so to give you an idea uh, and looking at the, the next slide, um, you know, some of the areas where this touch on, um, and we still expect the community and, and will support the community in developing a wide range of projects in terms of citizen science, open source libraries, and other services that help advance uh, scientific research. Each of our divisions will be further providing uh, support for things like data archives uh, and algorithm and, and scientific processing development. But what SMD will be looking to provide across the different divisions is hybrid computing environments, which actually uh, provide a range of uh, security, uh, but also a range of access uh, so that people can actually access and um, have available to them the uh, computing that they need, uh, as I mentioned, to answer the scientific questions uh, that they're interested in. And this is also providing some of the common tools uh, that would be available to everyone, like in terms of open science training, uh, common uh, data and software uh, repositories um, that provide uh, generalist repositories for people to share their data, like uh, sources like Zenodo or OSF, I mean, also provide some of the services in terms of security and long-term preservation um, that are needed across our communities. And then the last slide, um, if you go to the last slide, we also have our incentives. And so uh, we provide a lot of funding to support open science as well and a lot wide range of different opportunities um, because you know, we know the community is the ones who are leading on open science here. And we want to support you in your efforts um, as you help advance uh, science in your different fields. And so some of the different opportunities include the topical workshop symposium and conferences. Our uh, TWISC uh, opportunity uh, helps support, um, we're interested in supporting open science uh, meetings that help support things like hackathons or data challenges uh, or discussions around topics around open science. We also support um, open science uh, tools, frameworks, and libraries, um, things like SciPy, NumPy, X-Array, uh, many of the different open source tools which are actually used in wide scientific communities. Uh, and we'll be um, releasing that call again in uh, as part of Roses 24, uh, in the, uh, hopefully in the, around the March timeframe. We also support um, machine learning and, and citizen science activities um, through our, our different um, calls on multi-domain reusable artificial intelligent tools and our scientific citizen science seed funding programs. And then two calls that we have open all the time. These are uh, two calls that we um, are no due date programs. They're always open. We're always accepting applications, which is our high priority open source science call, which is uh, basically uh, supports innovative and new ways to support open science. Uh, this includes about um, basically funding for about one year for $100,000 to, to help um, uh, support innovative open science programs. And we also have our supplement for open science and cloud computing. For those with existing NASA grants, uh, this supplement helps uh, provides enhancements for either making the existing research more openly accessible. This could include um, openly releasing the, the code associated with it, um, uh, releasing open data sets, helping to support um, uh, collaborative engagement as part of the program. These are all things which are um, acceptable uh, to submit under that program. Uh, but we also have a specific supplement in there as well for supporting cloud computing. If you have an existing NASA grant and would like cloud credits, uh, we have this program open and uh, accepting calls with it. And so hopefully maybe as you uh, discuss things today, 
um, and you uh, as you generate some great ideas. Um, hopefully, some of you will will reach out um, and be interested in uh, uh, possibly submitting to to help support those activities under some of our open science calls. Um, and so, uh, if you go to the last slide, I'll. I'll wrap up there, um, but you can go here to our link to our open source science um, website, uh, which have links to all the different things which I've talked about in this uh, talk, um, including um, both the links to the, the NASA Transform to Open Science. And so going to um, uh, sign up and register for the um, Open Science 101 course, which is now open, uh, along with links to all of our different incentives uh, and solicitations, which are part of our Open Science program. And so um, really excited uh, for the discussions that you'll have today. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time and um, uh, listening to what the different work on open science we're doing here at NASA. Thank you. So we'll take time if anyone in room or online has one or two questions for Dr. Crawford. Is there anyone in the room first that has a question? Great. Hi, Steve. Um, thanks for that presentation. Um, it's really exciting to kind of see the progress that we've made um, as a community uh, in the last or in the first year of open science. Um, I have two questions. One is probably easy and one is a little bit more challenging. Uh, the first one is, I wasn't sure what you meant by the phrase evolution in one of those beginning slides as part of the OSSI, um, kind of what that meant. And then the second one is um, it, that I love like what we're doing and, and the policy changes that have been made. But one thing that keeps almost on a daily basis kind of like putting a, a stick in in the bike spokes is is authentication issue authentication issues and I was just kind of brainstorming privately and I was wondering if like you think it would be possible to authenticate in something like github instead of earth data login okay let me um so the first question which is what do I mean by evolution um yes. and with this we kind of mean how we help communities, um, uh, evolve and adapt new data science and open science uh, and and computing um, technologies, processes, and and um, uh, practices. So, for example, how we help communities um, adopt new open science practices or new uh, data science uh, technology like artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, and so helping. Um, communities evolve um, how they're doing uh, a science. And, and that's kind of what we mean by, by evolution in there. Um, and, and how we, we um, are supporting communities in, in adopting new technology. Um, the second one on authentication. Um, this is one of the things that we are looking at with the, the core services. Um, it is, we know it's very um, important to a lot of different communities, and it's, it is really um, a, a critical question about how we make it easier for different groups to authenticate. How do we actually balance um, security and access to things, uh, but also, um, you know, with without making it too much of a burden or a problem to do? And so that is going to be one of the key goals of the core services program. Um, they expect to re release their report um, early this year. Um, and so it is going to take some time to address those issues and how we actually integrate them, uh, make use of things like ORCID uh, logins or as or, or um, you know, the future of different login systems. Um, and so um, that will be a, definitely something in a continuing conversation uh, as we as we get into the next steps of the core services program. Thank you. Uh, is, is there any burning questions online? I don't think we have time for it. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and move forward then. Please, if you have questions online, put them in the chat. 
Hey, I, war I warned you that I'm not so good at saying it. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to mention that there's also lots of comments on the Jamboard. People have all the questions and that's so awesome. Helpful. Yeah, it's a good sample yeah, repository. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, a colleague of mine, Deborah Balk, who's the she's the director of the Center for International Demographic Research at Baruch College, she taught me a little trick in segues. Uh, she calls it a rainstorm, right? And everyone just just out of Please just go and make something. But you know, here we are. Uh, so you know, I'm going to make my talk brief. Uh, I'm talking about a project that's been mentioned a couple of times. You know. Uh, Called oh, the, the Science Core Heuristics for Open Science Outcomes and Learning School Project. Uh, you know, I'd like to think that the reason it got funded was the acronym. Sometimes <laughs> come up with a good acronym. That's it. If Bob Chem has taught me anything, good acronyms rule the day. Uh, but, you know, Dr. Crawford, you talked about what TOPS is, what the conception of open science is at TOPS. I think it's useful for all of us to see this federal definition of open science. That uh, you know was released with the 2023 year of open science. And it's the idea that open science is the principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy. That's that's an important part, and fostering collaborations, reproducibility, and equity. So it's a lot there, right? You know, how, how are we going to take this really complex definition and break it down into chunks that people can easily digest? That's really what these training projects are all about. Uh, so Dr. Crawford mentioned Open OS 101 or Open Core is developed with the AGU, these five, five online learning modules. Uh, there are also some in-person in demonstrations of it at, at the AGU conference and at other large conferences. I've been working my way through the modules they released last month, and I think, you know, I'll make myself a little bit vulnerable here. One thing I learned that was really useful was I didn't know about pre-registration of papers. Like, I've never really heard of this concept that you can pre-register an idea, take some, you know, some of the, the politics out of peer review in a way, because they're going to approve your idea before you go out and do the research. Uh, so that, you know, even for people who are working in this space, there's nuggets in there that you might not have heard about. I really encourage everyone to, to go through this training. It's free and online. Uh, the school project is a follow-on to Open Core. It's with this NASA Rose's opportunity called Science Corp. Again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skate through some of this, but the the difference is whereas Open Core is a you know general knowledge about open science practices. Science core is domain specific. Uh, so in the school project in particular, we're looking across several earth science domains and you know, utilizing cloud-based and local NASA data sets to demonstrate open science practices. And uh, you know, our focus is on the data science life cycle from acquisition to storage to analysis to sharing the results of you know, I want to acknowledge the other the other awardees who are contributing to this. We will hear from uh, Carl Boyer and Felipe at UC Berkeley later today about their top team project. Uh, so, so what is school really? You know, school it, it's it's made up of these teams across three different institutions. You know, here here we are a season. You know, I heard from a lot of us in the room. You know, we're also partnered with Tom and Josh and Dan and iSciences. And I mentioned Deborah at the start of the talk with our rainstorm. Uh, she's our, you know, contributing from the CUNY Institute of Demographic Research. The objective of the proposal would, like as I was saying, was to use NASA Earth Science Applications data and to demonstrate the data science life cycle. This will result in online learning modules. And, you know, there's, we've seen such demand already for in-person instruction of these modules, you know, uh, don't be surprised if we submit a supplement, Dr. Crawford, to try to adapt that for in-person in learning. Uh, so again, we're focusing on demonstrating the data science life cycle across different domains, water resources, health and air quality, EJ, disasters, wildfires, agriculture, and climate. Of course, here at CDAC, 
our, you know, our, our niche is population and infrastructure. So across these other topics, we're including information about how it impacts the, how it's population and infrastructure impacted. Uh, this is a project timeline that we probably don't need to worry about. The thing that I want to highlight though is that, you know, we are, so, so when you're at the, I have a colleague who says you're at the cutting edge, you're at the bleeding edge, right? So we're at the bleeding edge here a little bit. We're, we're implementing some new, new ideas about open science. And also we're trying to do that in an agile framework, which again is, you know, so we're learning a lot, I'll put it that way. Uh, but the, the idea is that we will be releasing modules every six months throughout the two year project. And that our water resources module by the end of February should be live. Uh, so data coming soon. I saw I saw some some team members make scared eyes there. I, I, I'm scared too, but yeah, uh, you know, there's there's some value in doing it anyway. Uh, so the module structure, like I said, you know, we're looking at the whole life cycle from generation, processing, management, visualization, interpretation, and sharing. We're doing this through case studies that focus on particular data sets. Pedagogically. Uh, you know, we, the idea of inclusive teaching is central to what we're trying to do. We're trying to use case studies and that makes sense to different communities that maybe weren't always very active in the scientific processes at NASA. So, you know, part of, you know, I think open science, a lot of times it's about the process and, you know, by, by using agile, we're getting feedback early and often from a variety of different people. And hopefully that ends up with a better product. Uh, you know, I'm sure you all will be the judge. Uh, active learning, I think is really important. So active learning is this idea that you can't do what we've been doing here and just keep hearing lectures. We have to change our modes of thinking every once in a while. The rainstorm kind of got us a little bit there. You know, some people who are really adherent to active learning, they'll say every 10 minutes, you know, change your mode. Uh, so let's practice what we preach. Does anyone have any past experience in active learning that they'd like to share? Remember have a class where you have to do some active learning? Susanna? Yeah, well, Alex and I have a little course of kind of mobility, and after the pandemic, Columbia has been in two minutes on the quarantine uh, and the bandit active learning. And that creates a different dynamic uh, that could be challenging depending on the number of the students. But um, it's also a way of changing. And I'm going to make a question, uh, but now we have to learn and change it from the focus on teaching to the focus on learning. So, what is key to how the other learn and how exactly that is? Thank you, Susanna. Brilliant. Do you have an additional comment? Or Dana? Yeah, uh, I think the, the person I learned the most about with active learning was the woman I co-taught with, um, who's from a slum community, has maybe a 10th grade education, and we were co-training uh, people in slum communities around the use of data and open tools. And uh, a lot of the material had been pre-prepared by myself and another academic colleague, who we were doing our best to do kind of active learning, all this stuff. And, and our day one didn't go very well. Uh, so the three of us pow out, um, and our uh, the woman who is from a community was really the best person to talk to other community members. And so she kind of saved the day and said, okay, look, I'm gonna redo what you did yesterday and basically watch me. And she did all sorts of active learning activities. Um, the first thing she started with was everyone, you know, or one of five volunteers and she arranged them and had a whole, facilitated a whole discussion. Um, and I think that active learning is something we can also do as teachers. Um, that was a very good lesson. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I mean, if you look at the statistics, you don't absorb very much if you stay in one mode of thinking for too long. Do you have a comment? Oh, no, I'm just going to share it too. Yeah, please. Oh, no. Um, in one of my roles, I, uh, I run the tutorial center. And I have a team of academic coaches and basically, and also a series of workshops that focus on, you know, active learning as a process of something that needs to be learned. Um, and just really showcase or providing students the tools to help 
other students learn how to learn. Um, so I do it in my classes all the time, having different active learning exercises, but I think also too, it's something I think that um, we need to, you know, just focus on our everyday activities and really pushing students to become active learners themselves and provide them the agency. Thank you. I just want to mention that sometimes, and including one of the older comments, is that, for example, the students, they are really involved with the territories. They know the historical context of those communities. So I think that it's important, and especially from like the remote sensing data and this kind of information, which is global, the historical and local context is really important to, to tie those global and local. So those connections are important. And I think we should think how the students can be persons who can learn and read more about territory as realistic and interdisciplinary. Thank you. Uh, you know, this is another thing where like here in person, we could, you know, I can say something and keep us up, we can change what we're doing. In an asynchronous online learning environment, how do you do that? Uh, so I'd love to hear your ideas on how to do that effectively in an asynchronous environment. I mean, people sometimes they'll click on another website, but you know, these days I don't think people aren't reading as much text as they used to, especially in, in an internet environment. So we're trying to find a sweet spot there. How do yeah. we do that? Is, is, yeah. uh, yes. Literally teaching an asynchronous global learning change class this semester. Um, and one of the things that the that some myself and colleagues in our department have started engaging with um, is different formats of assignments that are project based. So leveraging, like our institution has the Adobe Creative Commons, where there's a suite of different Adobe products, and some of those are not very far for the students to sort of uptake in and use. So creating infographics associated with some type of topic area is one type of activity. That they seem to get into that it seems to have some dynamic engagement. Sarah, did you want to say something? Well, I was just gonna, I've, I've done some active learning too, and I was also thinking about how, um, and I have young kids, I have kids who are in their 20s. So, um, what I know is that they're learning, they're already doing active learning, so it's not like we're gonna teach them how to do active learning or set up. They're already doing it. So I also think that you know, going to where they are already um, and seeing how they're already doing their learning through YouTube, through you know uh, TikTok, through whatever their various formats are, but that they already have the skills and we want to learn from them is the key thing. And then providing them with some critical additional tools that would help them you know, be more discriminating, be more thoughtful or I mean but I think mostly what I'm trying to say is rather than thinking of this as us teaching them how to do active learning that they're already doing it and they probably need to teach us how to do it. Yeah absolutely I couldn't agree more that you know it's not a field of doing so you, if they build it no one comes is what's been my experience. So you, I think you have to get to bring in two people for sure. Uh, I just, oh, you have know, another quick comment. Just very really quick. I, uh, I've been teaching um, online asynchronous courses for over a decade now. The one thing I really focused on um, integrating everything else what people are saying is a uh, lot of reflection and metacognition. So I have lots of assignments for that. So afterwards, in the yeah, yeah, we have in the breakout this afternoon. We can continue. I uh, I don't want to put I don't want to put Bree in the time crunch as much. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, what, what we've been doing so far, you know, I, I'll just try to finish up quickly. You know, we've been working on our water resources module. We kicked it off at an NSF workshop that was here at Columbia. And, you know, we gave, gathered feedback from the community on what, what direction to go in to develop our use cases. Uh, you know, since the workshop, we, we've been practicing what we preach. We've been putting our artifacts up and making them available to the public. You know, here's a case on Denoto, where we have a community that's a key part of the whole Tops community, but we, we have our, you know, videos of our interactions and, you know, any materials we're developing. Uh, we also are using YouTube, again, to, to echo Sarah's point, going to where the people are. Uh, 
our Git repo is in development. Uh, you know, Josh, this afternoon will sh show a bit of progress on that. Uh, you know, we're to the point where we've engaged with an open science team. So, uh, you know, we put out a call and the TOPS newsletter very thankfully also echoed our call recently. You know, we started to get a lot of people signing up for the open science team after that. Uh, but again, these are people from diverse backgrounds that can help us to review our work and to correct the ship or we think we're finished and find out we were not actually finished. Uh, so, you know, I did some outreach at AGU about this and there's been just a lot of interest. Uh, we are planning a panel at the AAG in 2024 as we move into our next modules on health and air quality in EJ. Uh, there's a couple of folks that have signed up, which again, these are these are different folks. You know, we're getting a lot of different people who may be more part of the NASA process to be involved and to help uh, inform us. So if anyone's going to be at AAG online or in person, I'd really love to see you at this panel. Uh, so thanks for your attention, and I'll hold any questions for myself until later. You can talk to me throughout the day, and I'll hand it over to Bree to talk about open skates. Um, hi, my name is Bree. Um, I introduced myself earlier. I'm at the NASA Land Processes Data Archive uh, Distributed Active Archive Center, uh, which is also like a live data library. Um, but more importantly, for my talk right now, I'm presenting on behalf of NASA OpenScapes and, and that project. And I'm participating in that as as a DAC mentor. And um, you will soon know what a DAC mentor is. <laughs> so, right. So OpenScapes is really about trying to do better science for future us and us right now. Us today, us in two weeks, us next year. And so that means doing science a little bit more openly, a little bit more efficiently, uh, more inclusively, and also more kindly. So just kind of take a look at this image. And you know, some of you might resonate. I, I know I've been there. Sometimes I'm there during the week as it is, like that little skunk in the corner being sad and Things are hard and I don't know how to fix my problem. Um, the whole concept here is to find some shared common ground and go from a space that's a little bit isolated to a little bit more connected and find people who are working on similar things and kind of go on that journey together. Um, so it's easier for us now and in the future. And it also kind of feels better. So in case in case you're not into fuzzy animals, here's an analogy with uh, Starbucks. You know, it's <laughs> kind of hard being all alone. And we know that some of the processes that we do as scientists and um, where we are in our communities can be lonely. And so, um, the possibility of having help and doing things together can be really great. And one of the things that makes it so great is diversity of thought and ideas and people from different backgrounds um, working together to accomplish really cool things. So, Open skates and open science almost go hand in hand. So it's really exciting to be doing this in, as Steve mentioned, the era of open science. I'm totally stealing that. Um, and now finally, we get to 
what NASA Open Space is. It's basically a mentor community of people from NASA Archive Centers and different collaborating organizations working together to help people and teams of researchers transition to doing science in the cloud, transitioning to do more open science, and um, enjoying what they do better as a group. And so I kind of just labeled this image here. The mentors are ones that kind of wave the flag. It doesn't mean they know everything. They're just waving the flag saying, hey, over here. And then the teams kind of come in from different places with different knowledge. And, and then we can navigate um, you know, different paths or find ways around challenges together. It's, it's a totally flexible environment and community. And so there's three main things um, that we're really focused on. Um, Kathy will be talking a little bit later today about um, the Cloud Cookbook. That's one of the things that's come out of our focus on making um, kind of a, a, a space to collect knowledge about working in the cloud and doing science. Um, we also have been putting on different workshops and hackathons and champions programs. Um, and we're just trying to support people working together and being nice to each other. One of the things that's come out of OpenScapes is called Earth Access, and it's a really cool um, Python package that makes it a little bit easier to authenticate um, for to access NASA data and basically provide access to um, the entire suite of NASA Earth data products. And so how do we support teams? Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Is it Alex? Yeah. Alex did an amazing job navigating um, the beginning of the meeting and kind of taking time for everyone to meet. And I really appreciated that moment because making a space for a connection is one of the things that I've noticed is really a cool thing that Open Skates does also. Um, and kind of embracing the diversity of the people in the room and also online. Those are things that we've also practiced in Open Skates. And so when we do stuff like that, I'm, I'm trying to break down like the mechanisms of how these little, little things can actually add up to big outcomes. And so, by making a conscious choice to make a space for a connection, it builds trust and it can foster friendships. And there's also just already more people in the room. And then having that safety in that space can make it easier to be creative and share. And that's kind of, I've noticed that's kind of when the really good stuff happens. It's easier to do science quicker. It's easier to make better things. And it's easier to be transparent. And so we're an open community. We try to bring lots of people together with different backgrounds and then collaborate around shared interests. Um, and the whole environment that we work in is a place that everyone has something to contribute and there's no judgment or issues around uh, what someone is bringing to the table in terms of expertise. Like if you don't know, uh, like everyone's able to ask questions and get answers and it's just a very comfortable, safe space. And so this kind of open space flywheel, I feel like unlocks a huge amount of potential and awesomeness. I kind of tried to capture the, that in um, some of the NASA artwork that came out uh, just for 2024 of like this, I don't even know what that is, an expanding galaxy. The possibilities are endless. And that's kind of how I think of these 
collaborate, like the things that come out of these collaborative spaces are really, really incredible and kind of are bigger than what any one of us could have put together on our own. And so uh, these are a few numbers I kind of put together. Um, we're kind of rounding out our third year of OpenScapes. Uh, someone mentioned uh, OpenScapes is, has 11 DAPs participating with around 55 mentors. Um, we have the Cloud Cookbook, we have Earth Access, we have different cheat sheets. We've been writing papers together. And we're really learning as a community about how to do things in the open and be open and, and be humble and genuine with each other. And so um, as part of being humble, there are, this is not, this is a little bit of new territory for everyone to some extent, even as we're making tons of progress, um, there's still things around the corner. How do we version control all these workshops that we're doing? How do we, how do we make it easier for people to participate and contribute in version control on GitHub? Um, try not to duplicate resources across multiple different, um, even data centers. And then kind of, well, even one of the biggest ones for me is quantifying open science. Like how can we capture, like, visually I feel like I tried to bring everyone along on this story of how it can be really exciting, empowering, and breaking new ground to do things in a collaborative environment. But sometimes wrapping a number around that can be super challenging. And so that's something we're working through. Um, and then cloud pledging, which is a bit of a new phrase. And that's getting a little bit at, we're trying to onboard people into the cloud and get them working in this cloud space. And how do we transition to the, them to something that's a little bit more sustainable in the long term, and um, but still really useful for them? Uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, there's lots of us in the room. Uh, Bree, Juan, Cassie are all NASA mentors, Julius in virtual. Um, reach out at any time about anything. We're really excited to be here. Thank you. If anyone has a question for Bree before we end this session, any questions in the room? Dana. I'm sorry. Um, I have a question. If we, if I need to ask you during a break, that's fine. I'm curious how this is amazing, and I, I have a very good appreciation for how complex it is to bring in more and more and more diversity into the room and across places. I'm curious how, if you've been having conversations and how you're thinking about as this um, as the open science and participation broadens. Um, creating equity when you have real power differences among the stakeholders in the room or the participants in the room, uh, when you might have like English as the dominant language and you have trying to bring in people that are non-English native speakers. Um, I'm really interested in how, how you bring in that um, perspective of equity um, and just being mindful of it. Yeah, so um, that's a really great question. Uh, one of the things that I will say is incredible about open skates is the consistency in terms of expectations uh, on a bi-weekly or monthly or yearly basis. Like every meeting is started the same way. Every every single time. Hi, how are you? There's an like a chance to like share anything you want. Like people say if their tomatoes are growing well or not, or how their dog's doing. And there's like a space to make connections anytime anyone joins a meeting. So even if it's your first time, you're still seeing a very kind and cooperative environment. And if you're a skeptic, you see it over and over again. Every single time you come back, you're like, wow, they do this every time. It's not just for now. So I think that's a way to kind of it's, it's basically the tone that's set by the group as a whole to say, like, we want to hear you. We want to hear your questions, like writing in the Slack. It's 
that tone is set so consistently that it can't be missed. Um, in terms of, and, and that works really well in terms of DAX and dealing with the power dynamics of hierarchies that people are bringing in from, from their respective organizations. Um, but uh, we haven't had as much experience for like testing of doing that uh, with different types of speakers um, and like super across cultures. It's been like mostly generally American, you know, business situation kind of like, hey, this is a safe space for you to say what you want. And the other thing is you come as you are, if you're not comfortable, you can just chill out and observe in the corner. Like there's no expectations. You can engage at whatever level um, is of interest. And so there's enough momentum within the community to support that um, and, and wait for other people to join if they're like that. Thanks so much for it. Not really to get involved with open space. Check check it out. There's a lot of great resources there, some of which we'll hear more about later on today. Uh, I know we're we're overdue for a break, but before we go to the break, I noticed that there's a couple of folks who joined late. I wonder if you could just introduce yourself, say who you are, where you're from, why you're here. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Hans. I work at CDAC as the security firm of contact. And I'm very interested in the science that the science that we're doing at CDAC, so I want to get more involved. Thank you. I'm here. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nassif. I'm a data analyst at Air City Parks, and I'm also interning for SISA. Thanks so much. Okay, so without further ado, we, we'll take our break. Uh, you know, I'm going to try to cut five minutes off if it's okay. If we can reconvene here at 11 a.m. for the next session, then we, we'll get back on time eventually. Thank you. You want to say we're going to alter our schedule a little bit. Uh, you know, our, our, our speaker, Dan Runcoy, let me know that his kids' school is being closed. So there's lots of cra crazy weather going on around. Uh, so, so Dan was meant to be the last person in this next section, but we'll have him go first. Uh, Dan, you want to go ahead and share your screen? Sure. Let me go ahead and get that ready for you right now. I have to hide all the other stuff on my screen. <laughs> yeah, thanks, guys. It's literally just raining here, but apparently that's, uh, you know, enough. Oops. Get the Zoom stuff out. There we go. Can y'all see me? We got it. Great. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks, Kit, very much for the the last second moving me around here. It's very much appreciated. Hopefully, we won't have a dramatic blizzard here in the next, you know, three hours. But that's that's how the public school system goes. Um, so thank you all very much for coming today. And I love this, uh, this conference. I think we should have way more of these types of talks and way more of these types of types of meetings because we're all wrangling with such similar situations. Um, so as I briefly mentioned, I'm Dan Runfola. I'm a geographer by training. I have my BA, MS, and PhD in geography. Um, and at, following that, I guess, trying in my in my attempt to become the world's biggest stereotype about 10 years ago I was looking for information on international boundaries and just where boundaries were around the world and to my terror I discovered that it's a very complicated <laughs> question and uh, that type of data was not readily available and so I started doing it uh, it's been a very long road to get to where we are today um, but really trying to nail down just kind of where international boundaries are um I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, but this is this is fundamental to many of the activities that we all are trying to take on um, within the human environment space, especially these kind of just boundaries of where we are, where do policies get enacted, where they actually have kind of legal authorities. Those are all defined by these geographic boundaries, and yet we don't have a very good handle on where they are, which is which is terrifying. 
So what is this? So this particular project, this is called GeoBoundaries. So um, these are boundaries we, we track currently. It's something around a thousand different layers um, that's constituted of a few million different polygons uh, that are just the boundaries of states, counties, districts. Uh, this is a standardized machine readable data by, database, and it's very popular. So we have between 750 to 1,000 users every week, um, generally monthly through our API, which we don't actually know the count of users, but our API gets around 60 terabytes of data pulled down out of it every single month. Um, bearing in mind, these are these are vectors, right? The entire database is maybe under 100 gigs, but we're serving you know quite a few copies of that in, in any given time. Um, again, to my terror, right? Like most of you probably know where you live. Uh, you like if if someone tells me, "Hey, where's James City County or where's Williamsburg, Virginia?" Right? There's there's legal authoritative boundaries. If I need to figure out the the when Dominion Power cuts the power to my to my house, I know to call Dominion because they service my geographic region. Um, in in the vast maybe even majority of the world, though, those boundaries are not made publicly available. Sometimes they don't even exist because of a lack of capacity. And that's makes you know, any research where we're trying to aggregate to these geographic bounds really, really difficult to do. And that's a lot of research out there. So just to give an example of what we're what we're collecting. So this is a, I believe Malawi, if I remember correctly, the ADM1 representations that we would collect. So just like in the United States, this would be something that's like states. Um, and then we go down to ADM2s, which are things that look like counties. And then we even go down in many cases to below that ADM3, 4, and in France, 5. Um, we have even more granular definitions of these local geographic controls. Um, so we get very, very detailed. You can imagine the pure number of vertices defined in this database, the points that define these boundaries are actually it's it's a big, big data problem at the end of the day. Like it becomes very challenging to manipulate these data sets. So very specifically, like why why do I care? And why do I think a lot of us in the room care about these boundaries? Because they're really boring, right? Like they're a very fundamental building block of of data and data analysis, but they're not they're not very exciting. They're just lines on the ground. Um so we were recently awarded a, a NSF award to support this. And as we were going through that process, we did a little bit of research to try to figure out how many papers and in what fields actually rely on kind of aggregated geospatial statistics using administrative boundaries. What we found in our very brief searches were tens of thousands of articles, right? So within our own field, you see this pretty commonly with index-based approaches to uh, vulnerability. SOVI is probably the most famous of this, which I you know, mentioned because there might be someone in the room who is interested in SOVI. Um, there's, there's, but outside of our field, right? Like economics, biology, there's just this huge range of other, other constituencies that re require this type of information to do policy relevant research. So here's where the true terror comes in though. So geoboundaries, we've been doing this project for about 10 years in academia. We are one of the larger providers of administrative boundary data today. That said, we're not the only one. Right? So there's there's uh, entities like OSM, OpenStreetMap, which we contribute to. There's entities like um, the United Nations SAL, which provides authoritative boundary information for a small subset of countries. There's uh, UN OCHA, there's all the World Bank, there's all of these different, and IPOMS, speaking of uh, Tracy Cooler over there, there's all of these different organizations that for, for whatever reason have needed to collect boundary information and very frequently have had to collect their own. And so they've done that just like we did here at GeoBoundaries. Um, so sitting down with them in a paper that I desperately need to resubmit this figure uh, came from, this is a breakdown of how much we all agree on just where counties are in this particular case. So ADM twos, and it's real bad. Right. Like if you depending on the source that you happen to choose your administrative boundary for, you can end up getting dramatically different results. So, for example, if you're doing work in Russia, the source that you choose your administrative boundary from to do your geographic aggregations could have an enormous impact on the actual results that you get, because almost no one that provisions that information agrees on what they actually are. Um, 
it's a problem, right? When it comes to research replication, when it comes to um, just trying to find the actual answers to, to problems that we're trying to solve, if we can't solve this more fundamental challenge of where are these boundaries, it becomes very difficult to do so. Just to give you a, a little bit more detail on what we actually see. And so this is just one example uh, taken out. I think this was Oman, if I recall. Um, just one example. We actually have a tool on our website that lets you create your own examples all around the world if you're interested um, of, of what these differences are. So this is a, a uh, administrative unit, Ashikwira. It's a state. Um, and we these are two different sources, which I omitted the names just to not pick on anyone here. Um, and you can see really stark differences between the definition of this unit. So if you're trying to, for example, calculate the average population density in this area using the gridded population of the world, that would be a very big challenge. It would be something that's really hard to do um, because you would get a very different answer depending on which data set that you chose. And so you end up with these, these seemingly minor problems, but like simplification, clearly an issue here. Probably coastline delineations are slightly different here, and possibly the underlying source materials that these two different sources had would be different. Um, but this is really not the exception. Like this is this is the norm. We see this all around the world across all sorts of different data sets. A lot of this comes down to how the sourcing of administrative down boundary data has happened over the last ten to fifteen years. Um, so without going into probably the world's most boring history lesson, uh, the fundamental challenge that we were all faced with is um, kind of everyone without any coordination had to build these data sets, and we all just did it independently for about 15 years. Um, because of that, we have kind of a, a very wide range of sources that we are all relying on. So this is an example from GeoBoundaries. So in GeoBoundaries, um, kind of the different sources that we rely on for our database. Um, these are wildly different for different entities. So the World Bank has very different sources than we do. The, the IPUMS has very different sources than we do. I mean, I kind of across the board, we've all constructed databases, sometimes leveraging ind individual country-specific connections, sometimes leveraging things like OSM. I mean, it's really all over the place. And this this result results in this kind of very messy landscape where it's a little unclear kind of what's right and what's wrong. And that causes a lot of a lot of heartache. So um how we approach this within the GeoBoundaries project is we are very, very heavily focused on the source that our data came from and validating that the source that it came from is in fact the source that is authoritative and should be able to provide us with the kind of correct information for a given country. Um, even this is very challenging. So within some countries, you will ha actually have different government agencies within the same country that cannot agree on what their subnational boundaries are. And so in some cases, it's literally the country itself may not know what the correct ADM twos are. And so these are not simple kind of like there's not always a right and a wrong in some of these cases sometimes we are making qualitative decisions based on triangulation strategies regarding kind of what we should inter introduce into our database or not the other really interesting challenge to this is the pure compute required to actually build this data set so this was something that i think took us all a little bit by surprise when we entered into this kind of open science space so um it turns out it's pretty easy for us to accept from the community kind of newly uploaded files. We get a lot of kind of commits to our GitHub repository, and we have a new website coming online that'll make that even easier. What's very challenging is once we have that data in hand, taking it and making sure that it is topologically valid, making sure that it meshes with our other countries in the database, all of these, you know, superimposing disputed areas, all of these different processes at the global scope are are actually quite challenging. And so what we do is locally right now on our side, we have a high performance computing uh, system locally that we put our database through every single night and we're effectively rebuilding it using the most recent data. Um, that process right now on about, I think we have around 20 compute nodes every night is still taking around three hours. Um, now, a lot of that is because Russia is complicated, but the, nonetheless, it's still a large computationally intensive process. Um, and this really inhibits kind of individual research labs 
from doing this. Uh, you're kind of forced into this situation where you need kind of centralized, coordinated efforts to build these large data sets because you can't do this without a lot of compute. Uh, just a few kind of cool things that we're up to that I wanted to mention uh, to this group in particular. So we are currently, as with everyone else in the world that saw ChatGPT, we saw ChatGPT and thought, ah, oh, what could we do? Um, so we're playing with LLMs to identify boundary changes, uh, actually integrating news streams, which is pretty cool. Um, one of my PhD students is looking at satellite-based identification of conflict. Uh, this is a little bit out there, but seems to be working in terms of identifying where boundary changes are likely to occur. A little bit more uh, e more readily acceptable is the satellite-based improvements of our shoreline delineations. Um, <laughs> while we get terrestrial boundaries are a mess because different countries disagree on what they are, shoreline boundaries are much worse. Um, there's a, there's some real challenges regarding kind of where shorelines start and stop. And that's uh, some of that is kind of the physical reality of shorelines changing, but countries don't want to update their shoreline delineation changes. So they may want to lay claim to certain areas depending on what their shorelines looked like 50 years ago as opposed to today and how to kind of mess and fix that type of a problem. Um, and then kind of what I am get really, really interested in on the open science side of things is how we can service very large quantities of users with this type of information. So as I said, we have around, I think it's 40 to 80, maybe it's 60 terabytes, a lot of terabytes of uh, egress every single month in terms of just people downloading our information. This comes with real costs. Um, we currently, our monthly bill is somewhere in the range of $2,000 or so, maybe 3,000 now for egress alone. Um, that doesn't include any of our staff, infrastructure, anything like that. It's just for the download costs. And how to how to deal with that in the kind of context of these open science movements is a really uh, interesting challenge. What I'm particularly interested in is how do we do that without too much centralization? Um, so, you know, I, I think NASA is doing some really cool things, centralizing a lot of the activities under one umbrella for, from the cloud perspective. But one of the big downsides for that is if I am a graduate student and I want to go play with NASA's data, I have to ask NASA's permission. And that's scary to me. Uh, and so trying to really make sure that we find ways to support open science in a more distributed fashion, smaller labs like ours that could provide this type of data. Um, last thing, I wanted to do a call to action for all of you. So if any of you have cool boundary files, we actually, as of last week, put up our new boundary submission process. Um, so prior to this, you had to know how to use GitHub. And as you all know, not, not everyone in our community knows how to use GitHub. So we actually uh, did some cool engineering with the GitHub team and actually set up a mechanism through which you can create a GitHub pull request without a GitHub account. You can use a little simple web URL and it'll do it for you. Um, and so if you, any of you happen to have a cool boundary and you want to prototype or test this for us, uh, please, please drop me a line. And that's it for me. Thank you guys very much. Brief thanks to the funders. So this was um, originally funded by the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, moved to Bill and Melinda Gates, and now we are funded by NSF. So thanks, everyone. So much, Dan. It's really interesting, and I, you know, I think that the work that you're doing, taking data and putting it into what's traditionally a software engineering workflow, it's you know, it's we all have a lot to learn from how you've been doing that. Uh, I'd like to open it up for one question, and can if there's someone online wants to raise their hand, uh, we'll take it from an online participant. There's no one online than anyone in the room. Uh, Jenny. Thanks very much for your presentation, Dan. I was wondering, are you thinking about um, kind of indigenous people territories and um, and how that goes into to this kind of project? Yeah, so so this has been a really interesting challenge for us. So from the get-go, how we have defined our boundaries is as countries would define themselves. So, so there's, you know, for example, between China and India, there's substantial overlap because China and India have, they both define themselves to include the same territories. Um, because of that kind of, I'll call it a uh, choice, I was kind of forced upon us, but that choice of how we define our countries 
only in cases where the the indigenous populations are officially recognized by a government authority do we include those administrative divisions. And that's suboptimal for lots of reasons. It's one of the things that we're trying to kind of think through how we can support other types of what I'll call informal boundaries in more efficient ways. Thank you. Uh, ben, online, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dan. I, I'm, a, I'm one of those active extractors of data from geoboundaries. And, and my question was about is is, is about conflict, right? Because at, at the bank, we 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 care a lot about admin zero, and we really don't have much of an opinion on admin one or two, right? Like we need to use them constantly, but we don't actually have sort of official stances on them. So I'm wondering when you, uh, yeah, so, so sort of what what's your sort of long term strategy on on deal, especially if you're going to be getting more community feedback, sort of how you deal with conflict. Uh, areas of conflict and disagreement. And then also a very specific question, uh, why don't your administrative two boundaries have the nested administrative one name included with them? You are literally, <laughs> this is absolutely true. You're the third person to ask me that question this week. Uh, hey, hey, I, uh, somebody somebody just asked me, it's like, hey, could you include the admin one name with your admin two? And I was like, I could, but it's a lot of work. Do you really need it? Like, just, you've got the name, move on. The researcher from Duke that just emailed me this morning on that. <laughs> Um, the the um, the question of the second the answer to the second one is very quick. Uh, as a part of our NSF funding, we're doing that, so we're going to be adding the hierarch the hierarchical nesting. There are some real challenges to that because our ADM one our ADM twos and ADM ones are not guaranteed to come from the same source, and so they may not geographically nest perfectly. Um, and in fact, they almost never do. And that's why we just haven't done it, right? It's very easy to do. We just we haven't just done it because. So are you go are you going to do that that matching so that they do nest perfectly, or are you just going to sort of attach the name and sort of ignore the 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 topological issues with the with the nesting? So this is exactly what we're thinking through right now, and we don't have immediate answers to this question, right? So the, the challenge is in the case where you have something that doesn't nest, like an ADM two, do you take the centroid of that ADM two and say nest it with the most similar ADM one, or do you simply call it null? And this is. This is the we're we're basically testing both and seeing sure. what it's like before we make any kind of further state steps there. It's a really good question. Um, your first question though on conflict. So conflict we've handled in two ways. So first and foremost, uh, every single independent country layer in our database is as the country would portray themselves. So Russia includes Crimea, Ukraine includes Crimea. Right, there is overlap in the country specific element of the database. That said, we additionally provide a secondary product called CGAS, our contiguous global administrative zones database. And that is one layer for the entire world. So like ADM zero, you could just download the whole world. In those cases, we defer to the US Department of State. That's our current strategy for this. So we, we take the US Department of State, we burn in disputed areas, um, and we then kind of edge match to around those dispute, disputed areas. Um, that's not probably our long-term solution. So I think in the longer term, what we would like is to be able to allow users to download our Seagas product according to their own perspective. So if you want to download using, say, the United Nations definitions of ADM zeros, you could. If you wanted to use the World Bank definitions of ADM zeros, you could. Um, but we don't. Right now, we're kind of locked into the U.S. Department of State ADM uh, definitions just because that's what we picked first because it was easiest to download their shapefile. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. I know there are a couple other questions in the chat. Maybe if, if you could take time to answer them there. So we'll, we'll move on with the presentations. Great, I'd like to invite Tom Paris up to talk about lessons learned from three different open source projects. Thanks again, Dan. Uh, thanks, Kit, and thanks everyone here and online uh, for your attention. I'm really honored to be here today to talk a little bit about our experience with open science projects. Um, I've chosen three very different projects uh, to talk about, um, but since we're a little unique as an organization, if I told you I was from XYZ University, you would have a mental picture of what I did. But I come from 
I science is LLC. You don't have a clue what we do. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what we do. So our motto is that we provide evidence-based analysis, understand vulnerabilities, and change sustainability in a rapidly changing world. We're a geospatial data analytics company. Our niche in that world is that we work over large geographic areas, uh, so typically continental or global scale analyses. And substantively, we work in sort of a portfolio of four highly overlapping domains. Do a lot of work in water and climate. Uh, we look at corporate or enterprise sustainability. It's, it's not just for profit corporations that we work for. Um, we do work in human security, so food, water, energy, public health, and governance. Um, and we use the tools of remote sensing and geospatial analysis to do that. We do both sort of fundamental uh, remote sensing. So what you're seeing there is we uh, maintain a model of record for bi-direction reflectance distribution functions. For those of you who are remote sensing, you know what that is. I'm not going to go into it. But we also do applied remote sensing, so mapping irrigated areas, for example. And I'm going to talk about three uh, projects. So one is our water security indicator model, and I'll define it in a bit. The second, you've heard a little bit before, uh, data analytics and tools and because security, or, or Dante, which we uh, co-developed with Season. Um, and then uh, a tool called Exact Extract. So Dan just did a brilliant job talking about how you create data for administrative boundaries. Exact Extract is a tool to help you use those data more effectively. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm going to go through these one at a time, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the lessons learned. So you're going to see, first, I have to tell you what these tools are, uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the process uh, that goes into it. So the Water Security Indicator Model, most recently, uh, with funding from the Corps of Engineers and Internal Resources and prior investors, monitors and forecasts surface water anomalies worldwide um, with a monthly pacing. Uh, we, we, the forecasts have lead times of one to nine months. Um, the, the model is open source, uh, and we also produce a monthly run and a newsletter that documents the results of that run, which you can sign up for on our website. Uh, what you're looking at here are maps of deposit surplus and deficit indicators. The reds are droughts, blues are surpluses. The intensity of the color is how severe or how rare the event is. Um, you're looking at an annual integration period on the left for the world, and you're seeing Africa divided into three month seasons on the right. Um, and one of the things you notice in and this is actually last month's run. This month's run just came out uh, yesterday, and I didn't have time to update the presentation. But one of the things you can see in Africa is this transition from deficit to surplus, particularly in East Africa. Um, and so what tools like this allow you to do is dig in and see what's going on. So I chose South Sudan, uh, where there's some real flooding and, and conflict and human crisis going on. Um, the chart on the top shows you the fraction of South Sudan population exposed to surplus or deficit uh, uh, anomalies of uh, uh, different extremes. So again, the darker the color, the more severe the anomaly. And what you see in the forecast period, which is the gray bar, is that you see that almost all South Sudan's population is going to be forecast to be in uh, surplus of rather, you know, uh, 20 year or higher uh, return periods. And then uh, uh, below that, what you're seeing is uh, the White Nile at Juba, South Sudan. Uh, and you can see the black line is the observed data, the gray line is the forecast data, and the background colors are the return periods, how rare the event is. And so you can sort of see that we've gone from a period of drought, which corresponds to the chart on top. And we're transitioning to a period of surplus uh, along the White Nile. Um, it actually already, you know, extreme surpluses in a high flow time of year, but we're, we're projecting those to um, 
continue into the future. So that's the sort of thing that you can do with a tool. So how did we develop it? Um, we were initially funded by a group uh, looking at national security implications of climate change. And we said, well, if you're interested in climate change, you've got to be interested in water. Um, knowing what's going to happen in 20, 30, 40 years from now is really important, but the pacing of your community works on much shorter time scales. So we were interested in sort of this one to nine month uh, lead time. And we started with nothing. Uh, we convened expertise, scientists, we convened our users, the analysts, and we convened the engineers, us. Uh, and actually, um, Kit and Bob Chen and some others from Seedon were involved in this effort as well. Um, and we implemented in a series of three spirals where we designed, we built, we assessed, and uh, each of those spirals was kicked off and terminated by a one day workshop, in person workshop, uh, where we presented the results. The analyst said, We like this. Could you do that for us? It was a little differently. The scientist said, Have you thought about this or that phenomena? Um, the analysts and the scientists love talking to each other, so there was a lot of byproduct of just bringing the community together. Um, and we iterated this three times. And the reason why I'm focusing on this is we invested a lot in the process. If we just wanted to build it by ourselves, we could have done it a lot less expensively and probably not as well. Um, and I think one of the, for me, one of the big lessons, and you'll hear this as a theme in, in, uh, in the discussion, uh, is open science doesn't necessarily mean inexpensive science. You have to invest in process. Um, and I don't think that's universally acknowledged. Just because you put it on GitHub doesn't mean you're really being open. Uh, open is this sort of engagement that we're doing today, and it's not inexpensive. Um, what we ended up at the end of that, and we start, you know, in 18 months, we actually had a functioning system that was producing monthly reporting, and the analysts were gobbling up and doing their work on it, but it was effectively a first, you know, a, a version zero system. It was pretty brittle in terms of how it was architected. Uh, so then what we got from the Corps of Engineers was a second tranche of investment to re-architect it, open source it, and make it much more configurable. Um, and the other part of being open, in addition to making it open source, is we publish our results publicly with no cost. Now, we don't publish everything because we still have to spy as a company. But it's really important, particularly when you're doing prediction, got to be honest. This is what we predicted on this date. And people can assess that and decide whether your predictions are of sufficient quality for their use case. Uh, the, uh, we also do validation, but ultimately people want to see, did you predict the events I'm interested in? Uh, and we, you know, we do have to subscribe as, survive as a company. So we do subscription-based reporting that are, you know, tailored specifically to uh, specific communities' needs. Uh, just to give a sense of the region, think how, you know, we've been able to reconfigure it. We started driving WSIM with data from the Climate Prediction Center, the, the central column there. What you're looking at is the United States four seasons in 2011. Um, we've migrated it now. We're using the drivers from uh, ERA5, so that's the column on the right. And then the column on the left, we're using, instead of doing our own land surface modeling, we're using GLS 2.0 which is intended for climatic analysis, comes out of NASA. Um, and what you can see when you stack these things up in the same time period is that there are a lot of differences. And then you can also compare it to the US drought monitor. Um, the drivers actually vary the results more than the models. Um, the drought monitor is, has a lot of subjective input where everything on the left is objective. So there are differences with that. Uh, there's some changing baseline periods for the drought monitor. What goes into that are data sets with a whole bunch of different baseline periods. Uh, the ERA-5, after some experimentation, we decided not to use the back file. So we're only using 81 
or 79 for present. Um, and um, uh, uh, and then for uh, the drought monitor also does a hybrid in terms of the time scale of the assessments. So they do short and long term drought, and we separate those assessments with integration periods. So one year, six months, three months, one month uh, types of things. So you have to keep all that in mind, but you can sort of get a sense that, you know, particularly if you're following the, the, the drought in Texas, there's um, broad picture, a lot of agreement, and in detail, a lot of disagreement. Uh, I should say the GLDAS version is deposited as a data set that's publicly accessible at season and is being used as part of the TOPS uh, school edition. So the, the second project that I want to go over is this data analytics and tools and eco security or Dante. Um, this is an interesting project. It's for those of you who in the small business community, you know this term, but STTR is small business technology transfer. So these this is a grant program, uh, in this case from the Corps of Engineers, but it required us to effectively do a 50-50 split of effort between high sciences and season. Um, and our goal here was to create a platform, open science tools to advance environment security analytics. Uh, the content, we have data set descriptions and inner comparisons, uh, processing vignettes and tutorials, uh, R packages for common tasks, uh, and news and updates, bibliography, things like that, um, and an open community workflow. So the intent was that people could contribute to GitLab. Uh, and when they did that, the workflow would, would, would go straight through to the website. So there have been some real successes with this effort, but we didn't achieve our objective of building sort of a cohesive community of people doing environment security analytics, building common tools, contributing to GitLab. We sort of didn't achieve that vision. And I would say the, the lesson learned from here is we underinvested in process. Um, it also, you were doing this COVID hit right in the middle of why we're doing this. And it was hard to do the process until we sort of figured out, you know, the community sort of figured out how to do uh, that. So um, the uh, uh, the message here is, is invest in the process uh, and don't try to skip on it, um, or particularly when you're trying to build these community scale mm -hmm. efforts. Now that said, we can develop the tool uh, at first, for our own use, we found we were doing a lot of work with administrative data, which has high spatial resolution and granularity to it, with global raster data sets, where the resolution of the data sets was nowhere near close to the resolution of these administrative polygons. Um, so at first, we did this internal, uh, and we, we, it was for, actually for a commercial client. We generalized it for uh, as part of Dante and released it as an um, extract. And it's in CRAN and you know, GitLab, GitLab, it's, it, it's um, GitHub. It's a, uh, a, a C library with R binding um, and it's designed to address it. So if you look at these pictures, uh, there's the, the Philippines on the left and a, a river basin on the right. And if you use sort of the standard, out of the box tools that look at centroids for touching uh, or complete inclusion, you get pretty bizarre results when you try to look over those territories. Uh, so, what we did is we, we fortunately, Dan Baskin, who designed this, is a whiz at computational geometry. And he figured out how to do this very efficiently and uh, pull out rasters that give you the percentage of overlap. And from that, you can do a lot of other things. Uh, so just as a, a really simple example, uh, you can do mean state temperatures using you know, high fidelity uh, raster data. And you can use a third data set, in this case, population, to population weight those. Um, and you can see while there's some commonality, there's some real differences in states like Idaho, where the populations of the South and North uh, changes the mean uh, temperature quite a bit. So how do you use that? 
this is a project we, we did looking at electricity data to assess impacts of large scale hazards. Um, and what you're looking at is a bunch of data on COVID. But to build the model of electricity demand that we could use as a counterfactual of what it should have been absent COVID, we needed population weighted weather covariance. Uh, so temperature, downwelling, solar radiation, uh, some other variables that uh, were important in other parts of the world. Um, and exact extract made that possible. We were using at daily or sub-daily time step going back 20, 30 years, and we were able to do this from sort of in-house computing overnight. Uh, so that's how efficient the, the code is. It's a couple orders of magnitude faster than what we get from commercial tools and does this better job of dealing with fractional coverage. Um, as a side, uh, output of that, you can look at the partial effects of temperature and electricity consumption. So people are used to heating and cooling degree days. It's a 65 Fahrenheit threshold. If it's warmer than 65 Fahrenheit, you consider it a cooling degree day. If it's colder, you consider it a heating degree day. And what you can see is if you draw that 65 degree Fahrenheit line, it matches up in France, but it really doesn't match up in the US and later Spain. We're off by some fraction. And those thresholds haven't been revisited uh, since they were produced. And um, I actually tried to find the original citation for it. I think it's in the forms. Um, and <laughs> the other thing you see is geographic variation. So it depends on human settlements, how they're heated, cool, and, and human behavior, what the ideal temperatures uh, in various parts of the world. So it's really time to reevaluate that. We now have a tool like Exact Extract that you can use to do that. Um, so the process for Exact Extract is we had a need. We tried to solve it for our own internal purposes and sort of an ad hoc basis. We got some funding, we generalized it, we stuck it in Crane. And it's had over, you know, that we published it in 2020, first version. It's had over 250 citations in the open science literature system. So very fast uptake. Turns out we weren't the only people with this problem. But it didn't have all that process I was talking about before. So there's a, a something different going on with the open source software uh, uh, product enterprise than open science enterprise. We really need that process. Uh, if you had something useful, and you get it out there, uh, it can really have uptake. But it's easy to overestimate how many people want to use your particular tool. Um, in this case, we did a good job. In some of the work with Dante, I think we overestimated how many people actually do environment security analysis the way in, in, in the way we can see. Um, so again, war stories. Um, but I think it's really important to sort of reflect on what works and what doesn't and why. Uh, and I, 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 I'm not a science technology and society person, but I know that community is beginning to take a look at it from that perspective. And I think engaging the STF crowd in the open science world can have some uh, uh, positive uh, results. Uh, and then I should point out, Exact Extract has some funding from NASA, so the if we had our binding is what we put out under Dante. A lot of people have expressed interest in Python bindings. So the, the open source uh, efforts that Steve Crawford mentioned. So we were able to extend the work that we're doing on sort of deferred maintenance for GDAL, and we're doing a, a Python binding for exact extra. And that's actually also been an interesting process because it's a different type of process. You still have to invest in it. So that requires things like attendance in FOS 4G, FOS 4G US, uh, and putting out requests for comment about do you want it done this way or that way. So one option was to embed exact extract in the GDAL, in which case you get free language bindings across probably a dozen languages at this point. Um, but you get the, the footprint of GDAL, which it actually turns out to be really hard to build, and a lot of people don't want that footprint. So the feedback from sort of this RFC process and, and attending FOS 4G is they would rather have independent language bindings that were lightweight uh, that um, 
were just for exact construction. So it's a different type of process, but it's a software engineering engagement process that's pretty well established since the early days of the internet. Um, but it's different than what we're used to with open science. So I just want to point out the, the similarities and differences. And that's my talk. Do you have any questions in the room? You know, I think that those are important lessons for us all to internalize as we're, you know, we're working on this, thinking about the sustainability of these efforts over time. And, you know, it came up earlier. We can't just build it and expect everyone to come. And how are we going to increase uptake across communities? So, is there any questions? When you say invested process, what does process mean to you? Um, I think it's going to be somewhat different from project to project. So what you do for open source software is different than open science. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you have the participants, you have the intended audience, you have different roles, uh, you know, who's doing what. And it's easy for, for that to sort of spiral out and people end up doing things their own way. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to have a focused effort to really engage them iteratively uh, to achieve the objective in this case, you know, and I'm asked this new phrase is for action. Um, you know, if you're really interested in changing behavior on the ground, uh, it's a big investment to get that process up and running and, and ongoing. That's, you know, it's not a $250,000 pro you know, project on community engagement for climate change. Uh, so I'm sorry that you know what I'm talking about. Um, it, it's really hard to do it at that level. Um, Time and resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm not saying we need more money. I think what I'm saying is we can't ignore the need for the investment. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so is there anyone online? I think we take one more question. If there's anyone online, try to be fair. This online participants, Dave, I saw you type it in the chat. But if you want to say it, that'd be even better. Yeah, sure. That's uh, no problem. Thanks. Um, I appreciate that, uh, Tom. Great, great to see you and uh, great yeah, presentation. Um, I just had a, a question about your drought work uh, that you're doing um, and whether or not you see uh, or validate the drought monitor or whether you think that, you know, your products uh, should be used in conjunction with drought monitor because you can alter the time frame or the, uh, you know, the time scales. Thanks. Um, so we do do validation a number of different ways. Uh, one form of validation is, you know, inner comparison with external efforts, whether they be news coverage or something like drought monitor. Um, the, um, you know, the drought monitor is a, an assessment of record, uh, you know, disaster systems based on what the drought monitor says. So that's a legislative priority, and we're not trying to supplant that. What we're saying is, if you're interested in doing long-term studies from a climatic perspective, uh, subjective assessments create a lot of challenges for doing that type of work. So it's yeah. different types of processes for different types of use cases. Um, so I'm looking at you on the screen. That's why I'm looking away from the camera. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, 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 it does. No, I appreciate that. Thanks, Tom. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks again, Tom. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi, everybody online. Maybe most of me on this camera. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to be here and be part of the workshop. Uh, my name is Andrea Dawn, uh, and I'm going to shift gears a little bit to sort of when Kit asked me to come and, and talk, uh, he asked if I could sort of talk about some of these projects that I've been involved in that are associated with population data, looking at specifically human environment systems. And so 
Um, I've sort of worn two hats associated with different groups I've collaborated with. Uh, one group has been uh, tied to different funded projects that have involved on the ground data collection with uh, rural households. Uh, majority of that is in on, on the African continent. Uh, and then the other the other hat has been involved with a lot of folks here at CSUN and with uh, the World Pop group based out of the University of Southampton with how you actually create uh, open source gridded data sets. And so the next series of slides is sort of just to sort of like throw things at the wall and see what sticks to see what might be of interest for this group for, for having further conversation uh, over the rest of the day. When Kit asked me to come speak, he talked about, you know, sort of referencing this idea of uh, how to work with data that you can actually find. Uh, and if you can find it, can you access it? Uh, how do you integrate that data? So a big piece of what myself and colleagues and probably many people in this room do is this idea of like, how do we take different types of data and pull it together to be able to model it or say something about a system or an entity to better understand how that system or entity works, how to better manage it, how to create policies. Um, and can we replicate what we do, right? And so in the course of the conversation with Kit, some of these ideas of, um, especially thinking in a social science area, so just got done thinking about process and about investing in process, um, it's always interesting to get a bunch of social scientists and physical scientists in the same room because some of the hardest data to collect, as probably many of you know, is the social data. Um, because what the foundation of which that data is collected is built on trust and time and effort and investment and in the relationship building that then allows you to go get data that you feel confident is representative of whatever that entity is that you're trying to understand. Um, so then how do you share that data, right? There's a lot of privacy concerns that are associated with the social data. Um, and so how do you work within those limits? Um, that's one piece of it, right? That's one area of sort of conversation fodder. Uh, another area is if you're actually modeling data um, and you're using different types of input into that, is that data open source? Is that data available? Um, if you're trying to model something uh, at multiple points in time, then the data that's informing that, is it updatable? Is it timely to be able to actually have representative representativeness across time, across space? And then another really interesting question, maybe for, for this group, is and that I'm I go back and forth about is what's that foundational baseline that's expected of a user, right? Do they need to have a certain set of skills to work within an open science arena? Or is it about creating tools that are, you know, web design that, you know, somebody who will take a minute to read instructions can go through and actually create products of interest that they can actually use? Um, and I'm sure it's back and forth. Uh, along that continuum, continuum for different applications and for different entities. <clears throat> so I thought I'd pull, this is a figure from a publication. I was going to start first with sort of like this, this effort that maybe many folks here also have engaged with at one time or another, a, a funded NSF initiative that's looking at questions that are about human environment, social, ecological, coupled human, natural system, whatever, whatever term you sort of want to apply to where you're really interested in thinking about this integration of both environment and social data, thinking about that across different scales of analysis and how you actually uh, pull those data together in a modeling context to sort of ask the bigger picture questions. Uh, and there's a lot of time and effort that was spent within this particular cross, uh, project, both within the team that involved uh, colleagues from um, institutions in the United States and institutions in Africa for thinking about the, the science process of like how to actually achieve a three-year funded project and collect the data that you need to be able to answer those questions, but also think about what um, the, that collaborative engagement and time on the ground actually looks like and how you how you create those relationships 
And, and a big part of that was it did the project didn't really start at that three year start date. It was predicated by a lot of time and investment of different colleagues on a project that had spent time in that system that already had the relationships and sort of enabled doors to be open to be able to work on the project. On the data side, all right, so different social and uh, biophysical data and the integration of it, just because I like to look at pictures and think about um, data. Uh, this is just to give an idea for like how, you know, um, when we talk about open science, making it different data sets available, how to work with it, but it, a lot of that in terms of the decision making of working with that data is an understanding of how the data talk to each other. So raster based data, which underlie the next three slides, are different spatial resolutions of different data products. This is a church. Uh, rainfall data set from the Climate Hazard Center at ECFB, 0 0.05 degrees. Each triangle represents a community area across three different countries that have within that area five different villages that were sampled for household surveys. All right. This is one example of model data with some variation across countries, but within those communities, not a whole lot of variation when you're modeling data. Variability matters in terms of your data. The amount of data that you have matters. Um, different, you know, another example of a raster based data product that could be really helpful for thinking about environmental relationships with people, uh, a, a distance of floodplain variable. You can get higher resolution data, normalized difference vegetation index, uh, where you start getting at more variation in that spatial. Uh, representation of environmental variability, uh, but again, you're, you're you're trying to think about how do you link those individual household level uh, pieces of information with these different scales, spatial and temporal, of environmental data that's available, accessible, and then you have to wrangle all of that together um, in some type of whatever approach that your you that you or your team decides on for for looking at a system. In terms of making data available from, from this type of project, FigShare, GitHub, these are like type of general repositories where you get a peer-reviewed publication uh, and then you put a data set up on one of these uh, repositories that folks can go to and ideally pull down that data and replicate those results. There's, we have multiple, like we create different data sets specific to the different uh, research questions that are associated with a paper. And so different pieces of that data that were collected in the field that took a lot of time and effort are represented in these. Um, but I oftentimes think about those ideas of what else could be useful is that the household survey that was part of this project, there's a series of questions that were designed that are based off of the uh, five, what is that? Food and security experience scale. It informs the SDG2 indicators. Um, it's a standardized set of questions that are adopted by lots of countries. And imagine if you could actually have a resource where you could find where those questions have been asked in these types of studies. I think about that a lot because it like just opens up lots of possibilities for the types of things that you might be able to do. And not necessarily just those questions, but similar standardized questions across different different surveys, different research. So data, so um, data producers, data users, I've been in the same room before where we've talked about that, had people from both sides. I sit in both buckets depending on the project. Uh, but a lot of things translate between these two different groups in terms of thinking about questions with data. All right, uh, what data are you using? What quality and what level of confidence do you have in the data sets that you're choosing to work with? Are they acceptable? <laughs> are they acceptable? Are they accessible? Uh, and can they be updated? That's back to the whole temporality question associated with creating products over time. Uh, and then and this goes back, like on the data producer side, this goes back to re replic replicability. How can people replicate what you're doing? Can they go get the same data um, that you use and create the same kind of output? On the data user side, oftentimes I'm thinking about 
uh, with the integration piece scale and the, and the, and sort of matching data across scale, or whether or not data can act like whether you're interested in being able to take some type of analysis at one resolution and um, scale it up to a different resolution. And then, regardless of what bucket you stand in um, or spend the most time in, uncertainty of being able to capture some ideally quantifiable degree of uncertainty associated with uh, or a confidence level associated with whatever type of output that you have. And so to that end, um, let me shift gears a little bit to talk a bit about the community that I've been involved in with um, gridding population. So I spent time collecting household survey data, being, being part of projects that are going um, and talking to individual households. There's also a whole arena associated with other surveying in, um, efforts, uh, census-based data products. Uh, but then there's also a big space for thinking about gridding different types of survey and census-based data. Uh, and gridded population data, uh, this has been going on for decades. CSUN has been a really big um, uh, contributor to this space with the DPW products that have been coming out over the past few, um, for the past few decades. But the idea is with the gridded products is you can get these comparable, consistent units of analysis that integrate more easily with other types of products. Because when you think about census-based uh, or survey-based data, maybe you tie that to some administrative uh, unit at some level, but those are going to be irregularly shaped uh, polygons. And this is a way of sort of making that data a bit more streamlined for different types of uh, analyses. Uh, and those grids can be flexible. So depending on what sort of uh, level of analysis that you want, you can kind of work with the data as you need. Uh, and so two examples here, these are these are examples from the World Pop Group out of the University of Southampton for just sort of demonstrating uh, use case for how you might work with these different gridded data products. And I say products plural because there are multiple groups that create gridded population data in that group in terms of thinking about um, uh, open data science and open access and an understanding of the data a, a number of years ago we were like, okay, there's multiple data products that exist, all open access, people can go get them, but there's no real clear understanding of what's what, how things are produced, and like how this group's product is different from this group's product. And so there was some effort to put a data collaborative together. Some of you guys might be really familiar, some of you less so associated with the pop grid data collaborative. Um, really awesome effort uh, that brought together a lot of the data producers, but also data users associated with gridded population and also uh, settlement and infrastructure data to have a conversation about, okay, we are producing this data and we want the data to be used by different entities, um, but how can we make that data more accessible, more understandable, so that people can get a better sense of like, okay, it makes more sense in my, with my project that I'd be using this data set. Uh, a bunch of different organizations and entities that were part of the, and are part of the Top 3 Collaborative, uh, and one of the things that came out of this on the Pop Grid website is this uh, really nice visualization tool that allows you to look at different data products uh, and be able to do these quick sort of uh, summaries associated with uh, a given area uh, and what the differences in those different data products might look like. Now, the challenge here, which I'm sure Kit can definitely attest to, is it's not like the data producers are static. Like they, it's not like they produce a data set and then they are no longer producing data. So there's constant iteration and updates associated with improving on those data products. And so keeping a tool like this updated with the most recent and um, recent options from those different data producers, I think is, is challenging for a variety of reasons. Uh, that data, the, the bringing everybody to the table also resulted in some really nice 
um, collaborations associated. This is a paper that's a few years old now, but still does a nice job of sort of introducing this sort of space and thinking about a particular type of data product that gets produced by multiple different um, entities and the considerations associated with like why you might choose one data product over another. And then just to sort of uh, spend a, a couple minutes talking about one group here, so the World Clock Group, uh, which is actually where I got first involved with the gridded population uh, effort as a postdoc. Uh, and when I started at World Pop, it wasn't called World Pop. It had its own little regional naming conventions, and there was like five or six people. Uh, now it's the, uh, upwards of 20 plus that are based at the University of Southampton. Uh, and they do some really awesome work that is in our uh, aspects of what they do uh, very much are tied into some of the cutting edge uh, methods and uh, involvement of gridded population products. Uh, but they also do a lot of uh, spatial data support uh, and in workshops and different uh, development of tools for making data uh, not only available, like if you go to the World Pop website, you can just literally download all kinds of different types of population and demographic data. Uh, but creating tutorials, creating different types of coding and scripts and, 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 and conducting workshops to try to make the, the data and understanding how to work with the data more accessible. And as a function of that, uh, within this particular space, you get different kinds of products. And so within the World Pop organization, there's sort of two parallel initiatives. When they're working with the National Statistics Office or working with an uh, individual country, this idea of the bespoke country analyses where it's um, very specific, like the data products that are produced are very specific to the needs of, or interest of that, that organization. But then there's the global modeling that gets done and the global modeling is equally valuable in my mind because it's providing these data products that are uh, comparable over time and over space that can be used in other types of modeling that these um, country specific initiatives are it would be much more challenging to do because of the way that the data is produced. Uh, this is just a, within the past five years, different countries that World Pop has worked directly with in terms of producing different types of data products. Uh, and then on the global side, there was a, a, a global one uh, project that basically produced these uh, at 100 meter spatial resolution, a 20 year time series of uh, population and age sex breakdown uh, globally for, for, for uptake and uh, dissemination within various research communities. Uh, and this is just sort of, and, and in terms of that data, uh, getting an example of um, Different, different types of data and sort of that spatial visualization of what it looks like. But you can also go to uh, this portal and they have created this interaction, interactive web portal where you can actually get assessments of those different age sex breakdowns for the different years and get your age pyramids and then sort of get a feel. And the, uh, the, the administrative units, speaking back to thinking about those boundaries, um, which could be its own sort of workshop in and of itself associated with population modeling, um, but you can get a sense for like where globally you might have more detailed data versus less detailed data um, that is informed on. There's also different types of tutorials that are being produced by the World Pop organization and made available. And one of the things that's nice about this uh, is that you have. Um, sort of a whole outline, including diagnostics for thinking about the, the data that's informing the modeling process, different types of outputs that can tell you something about how, how well the model is doing and what underlying variables are informing uh, your modeled output. One of the challenging parts about this is it still requires some expertise or some knowledge that's associated with the particular environment that that coding is in. So there's, a, there's some trade-offs there. Oh, okay, I'm finished. So they're transitioning, uh, not transitioning, 
They've gotten additional funding to do a, a second iteration of the of the global uh, population data that's going to ex extend through 2030. And but with that comes like you have a lot newer data that's available to inform that process that makes it a better product overall, but will no longer doesn't necessarily speak to the older process products. And so then it's like this constant trade off and an understanding of like what those differences are. Um, Anyway, so just to sort of summarize, uh, I only said three applications, but there's like a variety that you could look there in terms of uh, gridded population and, and, and its usefulness within an open science context. And on the data producer side, I mean, there's a lot of work. I only highlighted World Pop this season and um, JRC and other organizations that are producing gridded population, settlement, uh, data or they, there's lots of tools, lots of um, resources that are available, but there's still some level, uh, some foundational level of, of knowledge that's necessary to be able to work better. And then underpinning all of this is is uncertainty. And these bullets are just uncertainty in terms of thinking about like the way that you produce that data. And, the, and how that data is informed in the way that you model that data, but I'm sure we can make a huge list on uh, in terms of thinking about uncertainty. Okay, so that's that's basically all I got. Um, thank you guys, and appreciate it. You know, in, in highlighting World Pop, you know, World Pop has been a beacon of showing transparent modeling for a number of years now. I call it the forerunners in complex population modeling of actually putting it out there. These are the variables we're using, you know, make of it what you will. Uh, is there any questions in the room for Andrea? I guess um, one of the questions I had was it was really interesting to see how you highlighted World Pop. Are you saying that they, or do you feel that they would be a good model? Like, what, um, where are they really excelling? in terms of this theme that we're all talking about and, and can their process or something about the way that they're doing the work um be uh, somehow bubbled up and highlighted and shared with others i think where they're really excelling is with the relationship building with individual countries with the country specific needs and initiatives working directly with the national statistic offices and being on the ground and having an on the ground presence, so they might go and actually do maybe a two week workshop working with different individuals from local organizations to really train and sort of exchange knowledge associated with like how this world pop model approach could be useful in the context of a given agency, a given city, a given locale. Uh, yes, one quick as your uh, upgraded model X. I wonder, uh, you mentioned that <clears throat> your projection is going to be uh, 2030. Is that possible? Because IPCC AR7 just, uh, uh, or just started. Possible to explain it to uh, 2050 or the main? Uh, I'm sure they would be happy to do that, but the funding is associated with the current assistance from the Gates Foundation. Uh, and I have no doubt that if there is a need and a desire that can be convincing, then there will eventually be an extension. Thank you again. Carolyn Holtquist and Ken Zimmer. Share. And is joining us online. We're going to be tag teaming. We were asked to share some about Geo Microsoft project um, that we've been working on. Uh, Kath Davis and I proposed it, so it's also at Montana kind of State University. And Andrew, Andy has been working uh, as a postdoc and has done a lot of this work. Um, so I guess, um, Andy, if you want, I can put you on a video in the corner if you want to chime in. You feel free. Um, so we're really wanting to reflect some here. I know it's kind of also wrapping up this part of the session about what some of those practices are for open science. 
but I think also to challenge ourselves of trying to improve um, and trying to make sure that we're including those practices within the research. So this is the initial project that we proposed um, from GeoMicrosoft. And the real idea is to be able to integrate using the planetary computer um, and using Azure, integrate these different forms of data, hazard data on flooding and heat, population data and land cover data, and bring them together. We're really kind of at the point of the levels of exposure right now. This is a one-year project and we're finishing up in a few months. So we're bringing together these different data sets across many different years um, and having a number of intermediate projects, um, products along the way, um, and then being able to produce those and provide them for the community. So some of the tools that we're using, um, I'm just highlighting because there's such a smorgasbord of different tools out there. So we had a conversation with the group at the beginning of which tools we wanted to use. Um, so, of course, there's tools that we need for coding, tools that we need for the processing, uh, which kind of language we're going to use, and trying to come to an agreement on that at the beginning. I feel like it was really important to have the project run smoothly, and um, we're using on similar tools um, and working on those together. This is the our initial um, layers that we are integrating, so we have some of the inundation layers, the population layer, and the heat layers, which are a product um, from the shirts data, the temperature data coming out of Santa Barbara, but Cascade Pulse we have been working on. And so they're basically intermediate products um, that then go into the overarching um, product, which is bringing these together. So I think it's really valuable to have those intermediate products also public um, instead of just the integration at the end. So <clears throat> this is a, the analytic workflow that we have. And we're also providing this like as a readme file so that you can see like each step that was taken about what was done to the data in between. So if you're changing projections, if you're shifting it, if you're reworking it, I feel like that's really important um, information to have so that you can actually reproduce the analysis and have all those steps there. So in addition to the code, I'm also having descriptions um, about what was done in order to extract specific things. I mean, packages change over time, a lot of other things change, and so I think it's really important to actually make note of that. <clears throat> Andy, is there anything you wanted to add here? Um, not really, no. The, the, um... The heat data set um, that's developed by Cascade is is actually hosted on CDEC. Um, so individually, all of all of the data sets are um, open access. Um, and really, our work has been trying to find a smooth way, I guess, to to integrate them and and kind of make sense of it. Um, so yeah, th this is kind of the main workflow. Um, lots of it is processed on Microsoft Azure um, cloud computing platform, um, which takes a little bit of um, Kind of ramp up to to get data on and kind of figure out how to work with it but um, in theory once it once it's on there it's um, pretty easy to work with um, some of the data is already hosted on planetary computer which makes it easy to access and and kind of integrate into workflows um, straight away um, others like the heat data and the population data um, you will have to go through the process of downloading and uploading onto azure um, which is maybe one of the things we'll, we'll reflect on a little bit later of, of um, areas we could improve uh, open science workflows. Um, but I'll pass it back over to you, Carol. I'll let you take this if you want. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, this is um, just a code snippet. I know it's um, a lot of text on one slide, um, just to kind of show how we will operate within the Azure workspace. Um, so the data that's stored on the planetary computer, um, you can access really easily um, using the Stack API um, programming. Um, and so how we do it, uh, we're processing data globally at the pixel level. Um, and so having the computational infrastructure in Azure and the, um, is really helpful. Uh, we can scale it up with a bunch of memory um, and run uh, processes in parallel. Um, but one of the ways that we use the Stack API um, is to define bounding boxes for each country uh, with the population uh, data. Using the bounding boxes to merge images of 30 meter um, flood information from the JRC. 
um, merge that all together and then perform this kind of spatial extraction using X-ray. Um, so for each pixel, we know how many people uh, approximately live with inside it. Um, we can aggregate over a, a buffered area the, the average flood exposure and then extract the heat information from the uh, heat data from Cascade as well. Um, so it kind of enables us to make this um, global level uh, grid cell um, analysis of population, eventually demographics, um, but also flood and heat exposure too. One of the things I'll just mention here is that it also took an iterative process, right, of figuring out which sort of, of steps we're going to use, how we're going to extract it for each type of hazard. Um, so the flooding and the heat hazard, we've had quite a long conversation about how these are different, how they affect people differently, um, and how we want to make sure that we're representing uh, flood exposure at like smaller scales related to the population, that their, their intersection may be different than the heat broader spread so like thinking about the type of hazard the type of thing that you're working with as you make the extraction as being like a really important part of that puzzle and actually mapping out some examples of it you kind of should see okay well, what does this actually look like when you're doing that count or that extraction i feel like sometimes that can get lost in the programming environment where you run the thing you get an output um but i think it's a really important piece of that approach of, of being able to check it all right, um, so this is one of the outputs um, where you have a combination of the heat on the far left, the flooding or the inundation, and the second column, population, and then these products of a mapping of where you have population exposed to both hazards, and the breakdown demographically of each of those areas of what it looks like for each country. So, for example, with Japan, with a much older population exposed, and with Nigeria, with a much younger population exposed to those same hazards. Is there anything you want to add here, Andy? No, this is um, kind of where, where we're at, at. I mean, with the project at the moment, is this is kind of the end-to-end um, -end workflow of having heat flood population and this HSEX um, data as well. This is used the, the WorldPOP HSEX that Andrea mentioned earlier. Um, and so one of the things that we're playing around with at the moment is defining different thresholds. So this is just seven days of extreme heat and seven days of surface inundation or flooding. Um, and so as Caroline mentioned earlier, we're, we're trying to kind of uh, make a sense of what is meaningful for people if you're exposed to a week of extreme heat. Is that meaningful or should it be a month? Um, and being able to isolate those locations and have a look at the age sex distribution um, across space and, and time within those locations. So um, we, we have the data assembled and we're able to kind of change the levers of what's the threshold for heat, what's the threshold for flood, um, and kind of who lives within there. Um, but more than just the number of people, what, what kind of people live within there as well. Which I think transitions well to the slide of looking at overnight. So this is the number of total days from zero to 80 here of heat and flood. Um, so you can kind of look at this across a, a chart too, right? Of being able to make decisions about what we might have as maybe breakoff point of what sort of products you might produce um, for those numbers. Anything else, Andy, there? No, I think that's good. Okay. So these are some of our reflections. I know we have five minutes before lunch. So um, some real quick reflections um, that we had when thinking about this project are really the importance of data accessibility. So that we wanna have projects that are able to be able to connect with the social and population data sets really quickly without requiring local download or having everyone store them all separately. It really does take a lot of energy, not just in the sense of us using or doing it, but I think also the storage. So if everybody's storing all of the world top data across every demographic and breakdown, you know, everything, I, it's actually a lot of storage that we're taking up. And I think it's really important that we have these centralized repositories that we can call on. Um, I think it also promotes equity, something I've thought about a lot with working around with populations now in the Pacific, um, but also in Africa, is having access to them, these resources on the cloud is really important because you can't actually download that large data set um, 
multiple other devices, it's really important that you're actually able to access it through other sources and be able to work with it. Um, so we mentioned this a little bit also the methodological side, like having really clear documentation and information about what was done for the extraction. Um, and I think it's also the importance of reproducibility of being able to actually do the same thing and get the same results. Um, so I think it's a critical part of science in general. Um, and then finally, um, the validation piece, I feel like for a lot of times when we get into like AI and like machine learning sort of spaces or really just models in general, um, there can be a lot of products that are out there and it can be hard to actually assess um, them and, and actually have the data behind like those intermediate steps in order to understand um, what happens. So some things we've been doing I've been working with a student at the University of Canterbury, checking some particular slices of time and making sure that we're actually modeling, capturing what we think that we're capturing. And I think that's a really important piece. Um, Andy, is there anything you want to add? No, no. That's good. I know you came up with these further thoughts, so maybe. Yeah, yeah, I could say this. I, I guess just um, reflecting on it and, and putting kind of our project in the context of um, the discussion we've been having this morning. Um, some things have worked really well for us. I mean, having such rich data sets available and um, easily accessed is amazing. Um, as Caroline mentioned, so, some of them are pretty huge. So that I think the age sex data from WorldPop for 20 years is two and a half terabytes. So can be a lot to work with and not necessarily something you're able to do on your um, own laptop. You can download a subset. Um, some of it is on Google Earth Engine. Um, so you can kind of interact it, uh, with it at that scale. Um, but as we want to scale things up to look at trends through time um, and globally, it becomes a bit more of a challenge. Um, so some of the data is already hosted, um, as I mentioned, Google Earth Engine or on the Microsoft Planetary Computer, which makes it really easy to work within this cloud computing environment. Um, you don't need to download or store the data, and they have some really well-documented code banks, um, which enable you to just read it in and be able to sort of play around with um, some of the data structure initially, um, which kind of speed, speeds things up um, pretty quickly. Um, but we have run into several challenges. The Azure um, kind of platform takes a, a little bit of learning to figure out how to get on and get data ingested and, and working with it. Um, and so that's one of the challenges of, of moving between um, the Montana State HPC system, Google Earth Engine, and Azure. So all these kind of platforms take their own work to be able to, to get data ingested and working with it, um, which if there was kind of a, a more simpler way to, to move between them, um, work could be a little bit uh, more streamlined and, and smoother. Um, the Stack API has been great, but not all data sets are available on there. I mean, that could be one way to... Uh, make it easier to add different vulnerability data sets, heat, flood, population, all these different um, kind of gridded products that we're all working on um, to be able to integrate and work with them uh, more seamlessly um, and being able to sort of integrate everything together. So I think that's kind of my reflections on, on having my um, hands in the data and working on Azure. Um, lots of opportunity in this space to, to kind of develop these two. And so excited to um, be in the room virtually with you all uh, talking about these today. Thanks, Yeah, and I think all of those kind of come together. And then if you are able to quickly and easily put data sets up that are to everybody, then it saves us from having to work between lots of different platforms to get the data there. And I think really just helps the community be able to build off of that data. It makes it more accessible for people um, to be able to use or be able to reuse code. And um, I think also shift it. It's one of the things I've noticed a lot is like, okay, well, maybe you don't really need the mean, you need the median. Well, if you've got the code and it's ready to go, you can make that change as opposed to using something that might not work exactly what you need. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, and yeah, any Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, I think one question I had is, you know, I think you guys are at the forefront of people using Azure in research for these types of things. I know that probably you're producing scientific papers. Is there any plan to produce papers about, you know, best practices for doing broad processing in Azure? 
I think that's a great idea. Um, I we haven't actually specifically addressed that uh, within the Azure environment. Um, we've really been focusing more on the science side of it, of the earth and environmental side. Um, but I think it's an important piece, and we need more of that. I did publish a paper with um, Liz Carter at Syracuse University this year, where he focused on the robust and generalizable and um, different sort of principles of open science which I thought was really important because it's kind of bringing together some best practices um, around what it looks like to work on cloud computing environments. Um, so I think it is an important piece and also for the educational side, which I'm sure we'll talk more about later. I would be able to provide those resources to students that are wanting to use these um, and be able to do it in a way that's making sense, robust and reprehensible. Re 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 yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there anything for us yeah, hi. Um, thank you for your talk. That was really nice. Um, so I'm also using the Earth Engine and using these global data sets to look at different yeah. engines and kind of you know overlap them and make claims more about like local places, right? And I've noticed often then the data quality kind of falls apart on the reach, right? So I'm looking at 60 different countries, but then you know, trying to say something about each different place. And so like with data cleaning process, it's been sort of tedious with these larger data sets. So you're trying to talk about a lot of different spaces. And so I was wondering what kind of stability analyses you're doing with like the data cleaning that if what, what steps you take in cleaning these global data sets, right? Um, when you make pixel claims and then what kind of stability analysis you do to test how those decisions affect your results. What do you mean by cleaning itself? <laughs> I'm trying to get a Yeah, so I've noticed like um Right, for like the World Cup, for example, sometimes, right, it's, it's all machine learning algorithms that generate these data sets. And so in some regions, it might not align like exactly with where people are, or there might be like a fraction kind of issue. And so, yeah, so like, right, these data layers on Google Earth Engine, like, I like that we all produce and work on that are like, they paint a really good large scale picture and have a very clear message in that sense, but locally, There'll be errors, right? Because they can't be like it's hard to. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I'm so, sorry to make, yeah. So there's yeah. a lot of that, right? There's uncertainty across all the different layers that we work with. I think yeah. a lot of it being able to recognize and also look at smaller scales, yeah, where that's playing out and not make bad conclusions from it. So I mean, I'm sure we've all seen different things where it's like, oh yeah, yeah. this happened. And you're like, well, did it, or is it just that something's been misplaced spatially, right? And so I think there is a need to be conscious of that, that the data in and of itself isn't inherently going to be right all the time. Yeah. Like we have to be critical of the data that we work with. Um, and we may not be able to clean everything per se, but I think we can be informed and um, make sure that we're not drawing conclusions that are inaccurate based off the administrative boundaries, the whatever model um, that we've used. And I think we also need to have more validation done of those models, right? Like we actually need to be doing more of that. Like the student I had working with me um, doing splice of it and checking and making sure it's actually lining up with national level models for specific hazards, as opposed to just going, oh, well, it looks good. We probably had like 20 days of flooding, right? It's like, well, do all those 20 days, do they actually line up with the national models for that, right? Like, I think we need to have more of that rigorous sort of working. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Eli. Uh, so, so we'll get ready to start our afternoon session here. Uh, so, just putting the agenda for the afternoon online for this next hour, we're going to see some really exciting demonstrations showcasing workflows of different techniques. Uh, we'll have a coffee break at 2 30. And then following that, we'll have a breakout session. So the, the breakout sessions, the climate impacts and societal concerns will be in this room here. The ethical considerations will be in the Kennedy conference room, which is a couple of stories above us. Uh, you know, Susanna will be able to meet folks up there. And then the open science education will be in another building on campus, a short walk away, which, you know, I'll have to, to lead people over there. I did also want to mention for folks who are available and interested tonight, we are planning what was kind of an informal group dinner. Uh, there's a, a Mexican restaurant nearby called Zapata, which is a great place. Uh, so we'll, we'll put a page on the 
Jamboard. If you're interested in that, just mark mark your name down so we can give them a call and let us let them know what the heck happened. Uh, so with that, I want to hand it over to Nancy Nichol to talk about some of the cool work she's doing with other science and all these cases. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. So glad to be post lunch. <laughs> like, get excited again. We don't have to fall asleep. It'll be great. I'm tempted to, though. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking to you guys about uh, open science workflows and techniques that we've developed through Openscapes. We heard a lovely introduction of Openscapes from Brie earlier. So I could probably skip some of my slides, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No, no. Now we get into the meat of the cookbook. Uh, but yeah, y'all have seen this probably so many times. But I love this circle. I think when I think about open science, this circle always like brings me back. Where I'm like, am I being an open science like connoisseur right now? I'm like, okay, is this Making my data is, is like what I'm doing, making it more accessible, is it making it more reproducible, is it making it more inclusive? And those three words really like bring me back and like help me assess my motives over and over again. So if you're like, huh, am I moving towards open science? I really heard you go to three words. Does that fit under one of those categories? Then yeah, maybe you're already doing open science, you didn't even realize it. Uh, so I've said that a lot myself. <laughs> yeah. Open escapes. Um, uh, just in addition to what Bree said this morning, uh, some of the like mentor communities, what we do is we co create common tutorials. We host cloud training events. And then we also practice open science ourselves. So doing open source code, uh, making it open communities, open software development. So everything that we built as open escapes is for anyone to use and to see. And so we're going to dive in here. Oh, wait, one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to freeze this slide. Um, the cloud is super cool because it gives you an environment that's common uh, if you're working in the same region uh, as any other person in like the cloud. So you don't have to change your endpoints of the, the code. You literally, your environment, if it's set up right, then you just have to go up in there. You're not like, oh man, is this package outdated? Do I need to update this? You have this common place where everyone's doing your code in the cloud. It's super helpful. So it can really be a mechanism for open science. And so I'm gonna show you guys a lot of workflows today that we've come up with as a community uh, towards open science in the cloud. So. Some open science materials from open gates. Uh, Brie already mentioned Earth Access, but honestly, guys, this package, if you're doing anything with NASA Earth data, this package is my favorite package ever. Please write it down. Be like, ooh, what Earth Access? Happy? Like, oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so, Earth Access. It's really, it abstracts a lot of the really um, like complicated output sometimes that you find in your code. Um, so like if you're looking for NASA data and you're like, oh, I'm searching for uh, sea surface temperature over this region, whatever. Uh, and then in the old way, before Earth Access, it might output at you like a million things of metadata and like all of them, you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't deal with this. And you feel like that. That skunk underneath the rain cloud that we saw earlier was free, right? Um, so what Earth Access does is it really simplifies the search um, and outputs digestible, like, oh, you wanted this? Oh, let me show you. Like, this is like a cute little code thing that, like, this could be what you want. Uh, and then also we've developed the NASA Earth in a Cloud Cookbook, uh, which I'm going to go in with y'all. And it has a ton of different just aspects to it. When the cloud, cheat sheets, slides, tutorials that we've developed, and most of the tutorials also use Earth Access. So there's like different uh, mechanisms that we show. So. Next, let's explore together. If you would like to grab this QR code and we'll go into the NASA or get a cloud cookbook or type in that website. If you don't want to, you just want to explore with me, that's fine. 
Um, I'll leave that up here for like five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's also on the chat. Okay, it's on the chat. Okay, cool. So let's just get out of here and go up here. I am just literally going to type into Google uh, NASA Earth Data Cloud Cookbook. And it should show up to yeah. yeah, well, welcome. And this is built across DAX, by the way. So, like, the uh, data centers that are part of OpenStage, if anyone, like, has contributed to this. And also, we're open to contribution from outside of the data centers. We know that we're not the, like, prime authority for every code that has to do with that data. We're just like end users ourselves trying to make our way. And so if you guys find a better way and how to do it, you're so welcome to contribution as well. Uh, but we have, and it's like iterating. So the last time this was updated was December 20th, 2023. And this has been running for like a couple of years now. Um, so it keeps getting better and better. So this is the, one of the most recent things. When's the cloud? Is cloud access and analysis for you? We have some questions that help you guide guidelines, different things like that. Um, and I encourage y'all while I'm talking and going through this, please peruse through it yourself. Like say, oh yeah, Kathy, we're missing this part. Can you please talk to your people and create a page on this? I'd be like, yeah, I'll talk to my people. Let's see what we can do. Um, but yeah, we're always long but wanting to do that. Uh, we also have like cheat sheet guides and slides. So if you're like, oh man, I don't even know where to start. Let's do, let's see what these cloud access roadmap, like getting started roadmap sort of thing. So number one, you want to find your data. Number two, let's set up a photo. So it kind of like leads you through the hard things that you don't always think about. Um, these cheat sheets are like a little bit old. They were made like a year and a half ago and in like, technology space that whole, which is unfortunate. So they need to be updated, but they're like good ground like, to like help you out. Um, and they have like some flow charts of like, hey, do you need to find a data set? Here's some cool websites to go to. And there's like links on the side on how to do that. And like need to access a data set, you know. Um, and you can go through all these and there's like uh, links on the side to specific Jupyter notebooks that will lead you right to it. Uh, there's some talk about environments, and as you see here, we have some things that are highlighted as like coming soon. So that means this is like still iterable, like people are still contributing to this, and again, we welcome your contribution. So this how do I section, I really love, um, because it shows you like little bite-sized snippets of how do you do things. So how do I access data stored in Earth Data Cloud in Python? And then it shows you a cute little, okay, import Earth access. It's kind of like chat GPT. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, here's my question, and here you go. Um, and this shows you a just very standard way. So right here, um, you're importing Earth access. You're searching for a very specific short name of a data set that you know. And then you're using X-ray to open it. And that was in what, like, four different code chunks, and you have the data set at your fingertips ready to play with, uh, different things like that. Uh, and then you can even do it locally as well. We have the same notebook locally. Uh, okay, you can also do like, how do I find data? Uh, and then it has like a whole Earth data search situation here. It shows you a tutorial, and then it was Python, also going back to Earth Access, stuff like that. Okay, and then you have a tutorial page. Um, and all of these are just like fun little data stories contributed by different DAS. Uh, so uh, my DAS contributed the sea level rise tutorial because we're the oceanography DAS. Uh, different places like sea surface temperature and wind speeds, that's using two different DAS. Um, so like we're trying to go interdisciplinary, not just focus on one little thing that we each do. Like I know CDA has amazing data that could be so interoperable with so many different center data sets. And so it'd be super cool to just like 
gather together with among all of us and say, hey, what kind of tutorials can we put out there for end users? And this could be a landing place for that. Um, so this is kind of like the primary location for like what's common among all the different data centers. I know that each data center might have some like individual things that they're still like, oh, but that doesn't apply here. Um, we could put that in like different spots over in the uh, like how do I section like use APIs that have some things that are for everyone. So like appears, LP DAX does appears, it's really cool. So you can have different sections where you promote your work in here too. Uh, okay, back to tutorials. This Earth Data Cloud Clinic is one of my favorites. It's written by Amy Steiger, NSIDC. I don't know if y'all know her, but she's amazing. Um, and so she went through this whole NASA Earth Data Cloud Clinic um, on how to use Earth content to work with a measure sequence type anomalies and using like Earth Data Search and then also use subset some of that stuff. So I'm just gonna walk through this really quick. Um, she goes through the difference uh, between subsetting and filtering. So sometimes when you feel to go for a bounding box, you're like, oh man, I only wanted stuff inside of that bounding box. Don't give me any of the files that are just touching it, right? So she goes into the different ideals of subsetting versus filtering. Uh, this is just an example of what one of our tutorials looks like. And so we have like learning objectives, prerequisites that you'll need, some packages. And then the cool part too for authentication, like we brought up earlier, um, it's just literally one line of code with Earth Access to authenticate. Um, yeah. <laughs> Y'all are used to the old way, literally like this big of a code jump just to authenticate um, NASA Earth data. And so this was amazing. And I should note that Earth Access was mainly spearheaded by Luis Lopez. Uh, he is in crush. Okay. Uh, so. This is like our secret recite short name. I mean, okay, short name. It's very long, but <laughs> that's just how some of our data looks like sometimes. And you can find short names in Earth Data Search when you're going to that query. Uh, and so it's finding the data for this time period and then printing out results. It looks prettier when it's not um, on this portal page, when it's actually if you're running the code, it comes up like nicer, but. Sometimes it's just how it runs here. Yeah. See, see, it's so long. But here we go. Text array opens up those results. And you have, a, so you just subset the data really quickly in different chunks. And then here you go. Beautiful image, subset. Uh, we have a ton of tutorials like this. So please check it out if you're wanting to know. And then some workshops and hackathons that we've had in the past. Because we also, as a group, build huge, um, like, uh, notebooks or I guess what would I say, Porto books, which is what this is for each individual workshop that we host as well. So you're not inundated with so much information. You're just like inundated with the information that you need for each workshop. Um, and then we also have some fun in development stuff and then huge, awesome instructions on how we built this and then also how you can contribute yourself. Uh, I know I love going to this, like, oh, set up, like, this is how everything is set up, like, how do I clone a book from GitHub? It, like, shows you different things like that. Um, and then there's even a whole Quarto book on how to create a Quarto book. <laughs> um, I use this so much. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> go to your history. Okay, so let's go back to this. I already went through there. Um, I should also note that because I was, we were inspired um, by all of this work with Open Tapes, Kodak actually also has its own book. They, they focus only on hydrology and oceanography data. So uh, sometimes the big scale cookbook is great, but like it doesn't have all the nuances and things that you need for a specific data set. And so we made this our landing page for like very specific data sets, like, oh, I want tutorials only for SWAT. And we have a slew of things on the surface water and ocean photography mission. So if you're interested in water data, we have a book too. Um, 
And I want to acknowledge many of our workflows working on these cookbooks, they really wouldn't be possible without GitHub or Porto. <laughs> um, GitHub is our main space. I showed you guys already that like uh, a Porto website tutorial of a Porto book. But we also have like a step-by-step -step guide on how to contribute to like a cookbook via GitHub, and we put that on our Podex one. Um, but yeah, I should probably show you, but this, let me go back. So the NASA Earth Data Cloud Cookbook, if you click this little GitHub right here, it literally shows you the GitHub repository that's underneath the cookbook. So this is all <laughs> Are you kidding? Yeah. He's like, oh, I'm like, oh. I think that was here. So that's why we have a cookbook on top of it, right? Because then it makes it more readable for people, which hence open science. Uh, more accessible if it's more readable. So that's a real big like, push there. But yeah, uh, thank you, Ash. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I know it's a good idea to put you after the <laughs> I, I love hearing you speak. So I can tell you to uh, Do you have any questions for Cassie in the room? So, one of the things we're struggling in our own project, the school project, is the difference between teaching people how to code and teaching them science. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what your discussions have been on that divide? It's so hard because we want to show them like real working examples, but we don't always have the expertise to like say, yeah, this is how you should do the science, right? Even though a lot of us do have science backgrounds, but we don't want to put out a like, this is the only way. So I think what we've come to a point is we get you to after like the access part and maybe visualization, but the rest is up to you. Um, that's kind of how we've done it in these notebooks, um, but there are some science stories and stuff that are also there that have been written by scientists and that we post in there, actually, so that was a lot. I, I'm backtracking. We do have science workflows, yeah. but um, the things that, okay, three, three. Yeah, uh, so I, I agree with what Cassie's saying, um, but one approach um, we at LPDAC have been experimentally trying is we have a particularly close relationship with one of the science teams that has a newer mission called AMIT. And we're working, we've been working really closely with them and kind of co-developing our tutorial scripts with them. And then in addition to that, throwing all of this stuff that we have up in the 2i2c hosted Jupyter Hub that lets people get in really easy is like an alternative, like is one way to say like, today we're gonna talk about science in this space that we've totally set up for you and dive right into that. So we have done that in a few um, workshops, but we don't always do that because sometimes there's groups of people who know they wanna be contributing back actively. And so they wanna know the science and they wanna know all the version control that is a lot. Yeah. So we we have those discussions regularly, mm -hmm. and we're experimenting. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew, thank you for the talk. Super interesting. Do you guys um maybe to everybody? Uh, but like, is there a, a space for for thinking about or educating on sort of pre processing component of working with multiple data sets? Because there's a lot of decision making that happens there. If, if you're not doing it right, just propagate error to the rest of everything. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tricky ground to be on because every single data set is unique and different. And so the pre processing steps for every data set is like uh, so many. So we kind of rely on the science team to put forth that documentation and we make sure that documentation is posted, at least, yeah, like on um, and findable. Uh, but like we discussed at lunch, like not everyone's gonna wanna read a 20 page document on like <laughs> uh, the pre processing steps for a specific data set. But we, it is a challenge and one that I don't think we have a solution to yet. Well, I think it's actually a good segue to the John's talk. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.
Hi there, my name is Josh Brakes. I'm a research scientist with iSciences. Um, the president Tom spoke a little bit earlier. I'm here today uh, to talk a bit about our kind of our development cycle, what we're doing with Top School um, with Greg and um, Kit, where we walked off to. So I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of code or anything. I'm just going to talk about, I guess I'm going to segue out of this discussion that we just had in the previous talk, which is perfect, as we're kind of, we have a big team meeting tomorrow, and we're kind of dealing with the early stages of development and tutorials and vignettes and code and what, what should this look like? What is the balance we should strike and what should we include and what shouldn't we include? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I personally, a uh, researcher and, uh, you know, I love open science. Actually, my favorite thing to do is to find a paper we publish, go through the methods line by line and reverse engineer the code into a reproducible workflow, turn it to a function so that you can expand the scope and patch it up, throw it on a crane with methods adapted from. Um, it, it's just uh, the fun thing to do. And, I, and it, we do it a lot uh, as scientists because we're trying to take scientific work and research and ideas and transfer it into reproducible, not quite production level that you might think, but reproducible, well-documented code. Um, and so I love doing that. And that's kind of uh, gives my interest in uh, open science and open scapes and school and Dante, I don't remember Dante, which was talked about earlier. So. I love reverse engineering scientific work and boxing it up really nicely and within an healthy obsession for documentation and package down and all these things that make me happy. Even though I don't really need much. But so I'm going to talk a little about about um, the module goals. Kit talked uh, briefly about school earlier and kind of what's going on. And we are developing kind of each module. So the first one is for water resources. So we have some experimental kind of vignettes and code that we're going to look at, um, talk about kind of. The learning objectives that we're trying to achieve and speaking to the conversation we just had, what, what's the note we want to strike? And you know, hopefully someone will have some, some brilliant ideas that we can take to our uh, our meetings tomorrow. We already had a nice little discussion at lunch and here. So uh, just trying to build on this and build some 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 early adaptive responses. So uh talk about open science components of that, uh everyone's favorite graphic, and then uh maybe some technical details with the data set that we're working with. And kind of some of our proposed analysis that we hope uh, to retain the learning objective. So, our first module that we're developing is going to be a series of vignettes that introduce water resource issues. Um, and we targeted a few data sets that we want to use to um, relay these lessons uh, and the narratives. So, uh, we're going to use some most near real time flood data that Mark's working on. Uh, we also have uh, some New York City lead data that um, we're using to map against census data for a vignette and a lesson on water resources. And then I'm mostly working on a, a, a WSIM based uh, vignette, which is what Tom talked about earlier WSIM, a specific version of WSIM that's hosted on a CDI called WSIM GeoDask, which I uh, talked a little bit about earlier. So, right, at school, it's tops, everything's open science, right? So we've got all of our open source computing, Python, R, Sunil, VS Code, Quarto, and QGIS. Um, we're using open source data sets that are free to develop, freely available and well documented. Uh, our development process is also open science. So, you know, it's on Git, and we don't really have a lot of like action on our GitHub with all sorts of randos commenting on what we're doing. But, <laughs> you know, uh, it is out there open, but we also, as a team, you know, uh, we're trying to make it open and, and bring others along. So, you know, as maybe some of the more experienced coders like myself, I like to uh, kind of lay the groundwork. Like, okay, this is how you get this data, and this is kind of the, the practice and tools that you want to use. And then I kind of try to set up templates for um, early career research assistants in our project and say, okay, this is a little quick, I'll show an example right, later about how you get going with this data, but now we want to make a vignette that uh, shows people how to do X, Y, and Z, and this is how I think you should do it. So we're trying to not only, you know, uh, have the results and everything be open, but we want our process internally with our team to be open and help bring uh, other people along who maybe not have access to experienced programmers and uh, analysts. And, and everything's on GitHub pages. Uh, and our repo kit showed link earlier. I think we need to maybe rename some of our stuff. The, the it's like 135 characters to get to some of these pages. Um, but anyways, and everything's out there and it can be found easily through our uh, season top school kit. 
So as we were kind of discussing earlier in the uh, question session, the previous one, we got kind of this balancing narrative for all these vignettes and this stack of content that's going to exist on the web to help people learn about water resources or environmental justice or whichever module. So, you know, how do you balance kind of the background knowledge about water resources or environmental justice, the technical information you need to know about the data, it's a raster data set, it's complicated, this is where you find it, and you also have to balance kind of the technical coding aspects. You want to teach teaching people to code, but even if you don't want to teach people to code, the documents and the learning resources and the open state stuff, it's built in code. So will someone see that and go, oh, time out? Or do they want to learn it? And do you just have a sidebar with links to go to the SF package website we can learn? So, you know, we're getting there. I think we're leading towards the, the background teaching about water resources and less about coding at this point, but maybe someone has a better opinion. So, right, water resource narrative. We're trying to, in this aspect, draw in um, kind of the human stories associated with the water resources, the drought, finding local news stories about um, our target kind of workflow, which is kind of sea layer. If we pick, say, a, a 2011 Texas drought, we're backlogging into uh, local journalists and trying to find papers and kind of bring in uh, how this affected people, what was associated with economic impact, what was a conflict over a water resource, because, you know, Shimojo was water as long all day, and the almond farmers was taking it, et cetera. We talk about kind of those aspects of it. Um, do we want to have a bunch on the background of water cycle? No, we don't really know. Technical data narrative. So data sets like WSIM and all these other raster economic data sets we've been talking about today, they can be pretty complicated. So you want to spend a lot of time telling people what a raster stack or a data cube or a giant net CDF file with five attributes and three dimensions. Do you want to go deep into the weeds on that, or do you just kind of want to leave it as is? And like I mentioned before, we also got the coding narrative. You know, um, the code can be there and have nice comments. So anybody who wants to see it, they can realize what we're doing. But you want to sit there and explain package and use function and you kind of override maybe the more important aspects that are about the data and the uh, the domain knowledge that we're trying to pass on. So the module that I'm working on and uh, is kind of somewhat featured in this first session. It's on WC Geodat, we talked about earlier. It's a global rasterize <clears throat> data set that shows composite uh, surplus uh, and deficit, so flooding and drought. But there's also a whole bunch of other uh, metrics that are enforcing and inputs that can that are uh, that are used. It's freely available on CDAC, you can see here. And um, and it comes with our composite uh, return period base, so kind of uh, uh, a, a localized effect relative to a baseline, which many of you are familiar with. But you can also look at having a preset runoff, and it's also offered in a variety of different integration periods, or just averaged over a month, six months, nine months, etc., a year. Um, so you can get this on CDEC right now. Here's some days that we're using. One of what you may consider a downside as someone who likes to do predictions and production level code. Um, it's a bit of a for me. It's a, you know, GLDS is limited to does 14. So it's kind of, it's an absurd data set. Um, and here's a little sample, uh, some jobs such surplus where there's both half and critical. So we want to kind of draw and bring in the, the human narrative and socioeconomic impacts of water resources um, through visual, visualization. Um, so there's kind of pre kind of coding or, or figure uh, outputs that we want to teach people how to create or just use uh, as a vessel to teach um, about water resources. We've got, well, all those panels actually Tom showed earlier. We've got national and regional kind of 12 month integrated panel. We've got time series uh, of a point location and we also do some population exposure. So the first one here is kind of how we use to uh, demonstrate project and kind of how we decide to, this is how our, our development group honed in on what we're going to do. Uh, the first episode is going to be uh, 2011 Texas. So we plotted out, you know, say the past 15, 20 years of annual um, average return period for a composite surplus. And we just tried to look at some interesting uh, areas. In 2011, it had both plus flooding in the Northeast and also some serious drought. So we come in there, so this is kind of one of the uh, sample outputs that we're going to be demonstrating and coding out in our vignettes. And then from there, maybe you hone in on just a small area and say, okay, well, here's 2011 Texas, and we can see month by month 
exactly when the strap's happening. This also makes it a lot easier to hunt down kind of the human error stories because you can kind of get a little specific with your search items to kind of find uh, stories that bring in uh, the human aspect of everything. So, and then we also are going to demonstrate uh, some code and some analyses that like to select, select the point location and um, plot time series. So here is Houston and in this 2011 graph, you can see we're the 50 year return period on what was going on in uh, August and September of January, uh, 2011. Um, so we're going to show and manipulate the raster data stacked up over a time dimension and extract out a uh, point so you can really see what's going on at a particular location. Then lastly, Tom spoke to this earlier, we also are going to demonstrate how to, uh, not just where there was drought and how much drought covered, but this also uh, illustrates how many people are being affected. So here's the percent of the population that is under a particular level of deficit. You can see the same 2011 drought, this is throughout the whole area of Texas. We've got upwards of 80, 85% of people in Texas experience a 40 year return period on drought, which is pretty dramatic. Um, using grid population, we'll take a set uh, and exact extract to create the zonal extraction. So, uh, these are the types of analysis I think we're going to be focusing on demonstrate which are drawn kind of new methods of water resources. So, like I mentioned, everything uh, is currently on our Git pages, and I don't want to run through code and everything, but we, uh, you know. Uh, borrows the CSS for nested tops uh, and open tape. So we kind of created some monetization with our funding sources. And um, so the, at the current time, what we have up is just kind of a, a, a demonstrating the baseline workflow and the code that's needed to grab the data, to pull in the geo boundaries. Yeah, I love geo boundaries. I, I wish I, I wanted to ask a question just to like just uh, crush on the geo boundaries. But I got this <laughs> right up because I made mean, it so happy. Uh, show you how to pull into your boundary subset of the raster to a particular data set, how to create some time series panels. Um, these are less fleshed out versions of examples. And um, do a subset to a, a location of your interest. So you can just kind of say, oh, I'm interested in the USA, or maybe I'm interested in Texas. So we kind of have a lot of the baseline working here. And then we uh, have to finalize everything as I show at the front in my to do list here. Um, finally, like the narrative that we want to do, we're going to flush out our domain components of it. The workflow is in place. Uh, and then, what I spoke to earlier about the open development phase. So, there's one that I showed our team members, and some of our early uh, research assistants who are working on the project, how to get the data and do some basic stuff. And here, this is not uh, code, this is a template of helping our teammates and team members go and carry on the development cycle further without me. Um, doing it for them. So here's just kind of best practices, and we want to create more this multi-panel time series. You should use the slice function, the ggplot, just helping our team members uh, learn uh, through development itself, not only the, the end product, but just the development phase, or the development phase. Behind him, there we go. Uh, and we have uh, Juan's answer. Yeah, How do you move that up? One height ish. Okay, we have Long's near time flood uh, data set with a similar uh, demonstration of the basic workflow, how to access it um, through Earth data, and even this presentation. presentation. So, it's an open process. I've talked to this with relying on feedback from subject matter and manner experts from people like you, discussion about lunch, and through um, questions. Phases. So we're always open and looking to help that and appreciate all types of collaboration, whether from our really career research systems or users like you. So it's probably a lot more uh, logo stuff there, but those are the ones that seem most regular. So thanks everyone. Uh, yeah, we're a really strong representation of the project in the process. Hey, sorry, I just had a question. Um, I was wondering if there's different levels of um, users of different educational levels. Um, and and so with do you how have have you really thought about how to present that? Like we think I, about it all the time and we talk about it in circles and debate it with other colleagues doing the same things and. I was a private program manager for the Dante project that's been talked about a few times here. We made it there. It's 
that it's important to have multiple positives that way you know who your energies are, I guess. So we, I guess, and are directed from our funding source. So uh, yeah, for the school project, it's undergraduate yeah. and both. Right. So they, they can still have all sorts of skill levels okay. and technical information. So it's it's good question. <laughs> We're working through it. Anybody else is that? Oh. Yes, uh, what is the strategy for communication? So what is the strategy that, that maybe, maybe there has been discussed on how they're going to like make massive uh, information about the people who can have access and to know about it because um, well, uh, I mean, kids can great bringing in all sorts of different people for the project development aspect of it. Um, and I think uh, once the content, at least the static versions of these websites, these could in the future um, be interactive workshops and binder and, and, and stuff. But for now, I think the static version eventually will be in some centralized NASA repo from TOPS. Um, but I don't think even they are. Yeah, I mean, the, the project, we, we weren't funded for an enormous amount of outreach. Uh, but it's my understanding from the program office that they will be helping us with outreach as things go further along. Are there any questions online for Josh? Okay, thanks. All right, thanks again, Josh. Next, I'm, I'm excited to announce Carl Clodiger and Felipe Montalegre to talk about their TOPS T grant focusing on environmental justice. Carl, feel free to share screen. I can see it. Oh, all right. And you can hear me okay? I can hear you. Yeah, so thanks for the invitation. It's really great to be here and uh, see some familiar faces and meet some new folks here. Uh, I think there's a lot of common themes. I'm excited to share today work that we have just really gotten started doing, uh, thanks to some support through the NASA TOPS project, to really try to open up some of these tools for what we're referring to as sort of cloud native and open source approaches to geospatial uh, through the theme of environmental justice. So we know that there has been an explosion of available data from satellite images all the way down to things like drones and sensors and eDNA. And we're in an era of explosion of AI technology, of computer technology to leverage this kind of data. But it's often hard to put these two pieces together. Going into our kind of roots in open source, some of you may be familiar with this kind of classic analogy from Eric Raymond about the cathedral and the bazaar, the cathedral being the kind of closed source kind of monolith. And the open source is about building kind of small things. And he quotes Anton de Saint Expersi that, you know, perfection is achieved not when there's nothing more to add not when you've got the cathedral, but when there's nothing more to take away, when you have kind of small bits. I, I want to give kind of a different analogy from one of my colleagues that I often use. I think of these as having Lego bricks, you know, good little bits that we can kind of put together and you can build cool things, but then you can kind of take those bits apart and build other cool things. And you can build like modules that you can reuse in different bits. So this kind of underscores the approach that we're trying to take to this problem. We've been taught that large geospatial data belongs to these kind of um, usually proprietary GIS platforms, these kind of big monoliths. And in an era of data science, that's not true. These are really just data, right? So how do we kind of get these to little bricks that we can play with? And we know and we believe, I believe, small open source building blocks can help us really catalyze innovation as researchers kind of get over some of these hard problems as these become sort of more democratic, more accessed by a large piece of our community. So a kind of a quick motivating example of this using cloud data from my own field in biodiversity. This is the, our largest assemblance of biodiversity occurrences. It's almost a terabyte in size, the GBIF records. And here we just quickly read them from a laptop by these kind of range of quest protocols. So I'll be coming back to this kind of theme. How do we make this easy for folks to do? So our project, Cloud Native Geospatial and R, like others, we're following kind of Quarto notebook. I think uh, I didn't put the link in here. Um, anyway, I'll jump into this in a moment. Um, so you can follow along as well. Uh, there's a, I'll just show you the link. If you go to bit.ly tops cloud, you'll be able to kind of follow along with me if you want. And we'll do a little bit of a live thing right at the end. Um, we've got a moment. So yeah, there we go. So this is shows recipes like you've already seen from OpenScapes. We've learned a lot from the OpenScapes team and tried to follow that model. So this is a Quarto notebook, and I've got sort of an overall introduction here of some different recipes. Um, our first one, 
we try to embed each of these recipes in a science narrative because we heard from some of the questions, understanding the scientific context and being able to interact with that is important. And so we have set this particular example into looking at how do I see the history of systemic racism and environmental justice written on our landscape from space. And specifically in that, we're gonna use an examination of redlining, a practice that came up in the 1930s during the Great Depression, where home loans were made available, but on a racist basis that made them available to white neighborhoods at uh, good rates, but marked immigrant neighborhoods and primarily black neighborhoods as being of uh, not good investment quality. This was an outlawed practice in the 60s, and yet today you can still see the legacy from space of that. And that's our goal is to kind of expose that kind of issue to firsthand analysis that a user can just run a little bit of code and explore that and see that legacy themselves in the satellite images. Uh, we wanna be able to do this in the languages users already know and work with. So for some people that's R, some people that's Python, the two have converged pretty much and you can do almost the same thing in each. And so we show that. So here's the R tab and there's the Python, you load some libraries, you do almost the same thing. Here I've shown the redlining uh, districts. So you can see the A grades that were predominantly white in the 1930s, they still are. And uh, they have very high greenness in the images that we have analyzed there uh, today. And the D grades have much lower. You can see the, the legacy of that. And again, you can see that in the R and the Python code. How do you run this stuff? If we're really democratizing access and making this available, we need to be able to not just look at a notebook, Often getting that to run yourself is a challenge. First off, because we're told we have to send our compute to the cloud. That's great if a group like Openscapes has already provided you these two I2C hubs um, showing the Openscapes Jupyter hub here, and you can spin up these instances. One thing you might notice, these instances, often the ones we need, they're not that huge. You don't necessarily need a huge instance to do this. You just need a good network connection. So let's try that. Rather than something that if you're not paying AWS for the compute, I need a place that people can go free and get free compute and have kind of a brick that can move around to wherever that free compute may be located. Well, there's a couple of places you can find free compute these days that has nice, good, fast network connections. Um, one is Gitpod, another is Codespaces built on GitHub. They each give you about 50, 60 free hours a month. If you're an instructor or educational use with Codespaces, you can get basically infinite time for instructors. And so it looks something like this. You click on this button and please do this and I'll do it with you in a moment. And you drop into an environment on your browser. You're still in the browser tab. If you've used VS Code before, you'll recognize this as VS Code. And there's a Python notebook open here and you can just start running these libraries. If you are not a Python user, this may look really weird. You wanna be in our studio. So if you just click open in browser here, you'll see that you'll find yourself in our studio. And this looks more familiar, maybe a nicer place to do things like run R and Quarto notebooks if you're gonna do it on the R side. Uh, if you're an R user getting into Python, you can run Python from R Studio. You know, why not? You can move these bricks around, right? Like they're not, they're not stuck together. Uh, where is this coming from? There's just a tiny little bit of config here to make that cloud environment work. For instance, Gitpod, you just say it runs in a Docker image. You don't have to run that Docker image on Gitpod or on code spaces, you can run it locally. We use something called the dev container spec. So if you open this in a local instance of VS Code, it can also load up that whole environment. It's ready to go. If you open the cloud environment, it'll be there, install all the packages from the Docker file. It's ready to go. So one of these lessons is not to glue those bricks together. Uh, we want them to be able to be modular and be able to take apart and move them to something else. We don't want to be stuck with Amazon. And if things are not on Amazon or we're not paying Amazon or our grant runs out that suddenly our whole computer is gone. We don't want to be stuck to Microsoft who owns GitHub now and owns Codespaces. And if they change their terms of use, we want to be able to kind of move our bricks where they are. And we want to do that with our analysis too, all the way down to our data products, right? So that they're not kind of stuck. We can kind of build bricks that other researchers can use. One of the lessons we've learned from this that you've heard me hinting at already is that when we say cloud native, that doesn't mean cloud compute. It doesn't mean spending lots of money on cloud compute. NASA has done the hard work of paying for the cloud storage. And honestly, that gets us 90% of the way there or 100% of the way there most of the time uh, because we can access that remotely. We can access that anywhere. We have a good network connection. We can access that with what we call range requests. 
This isn't a brand new technology. It's been around since the HTTP spec of 1999. You can request just the bits of data you need. And that's really powerful. But I think that message is sometimes lost in how we communicate about cloud. We sometimes present this kind of false dichotomy, sorry, NASA, where we say things like, you can either download the data, like you need to take that whole like 500 megabit net CDF file that has 500 different variables embedded into it and covers all of space. Or you can go and use an AWS machine and access through AWS. That's not in fact true. You can do range requests remotely on your laptop, or you can do them from the code spaces, or you can do them from inside the data set. We just need to adopt those kind of use patterns. One of the challenges to doing that, of course, is the login. We heard about the magic of Earth access earlier on. We noticed that there was nothing on the R side that would do that, thanks to Bree, who really brought this to our attention and uh, said, like, let's do it. And so we did. And so with collaborators in the OpenScapes project, we built a little R package just to do the kind of R side of the data login. And you can do nice things, right? So here's just a quick example of reading in a large set of 31 terabyte set, but we're just grabbing a subset. We're just grabbing one of the many variables in there, the sea surface temperature. I'm going to just take a glance at the first time slice. And it doesn't mean I have to spin up a cloud machine. And it doesn't mean that I have to wait for hours for that to go over the network. I'm just grabbing that quick slice. I can peek at it. The library is automatically downsampled. So I'm not seeing that a, a resolution that's more pixels than my screen would plot anyway. It takes only a minute. So great, we have kind of interactive, easy ways to play with these. Um, Andrew mentioned earlier, the nice thing about this cloud stuff that's already available from say, NASA putting these products in the cloud or um, from the uh, examples of planetary computer putting so many great data sets on the cloud. Not all of our data sets, particularly in biodiversity are on the cloud or they're not in a stack catalog, even if they're on a service. But it's relatively easy to do this thing now of making your own stack catalog. So we just made a stack catalog of largely other stack catalogs and a couple of things that weren't in stack catalogs, like the biodiversity kind of edge cases, it's easy. You just write a little bit of JSON and uh, you put that on GitHub and then you go to stack browser and it renders it like a catalog. And it, you can also interact with it the same way that you did. If you don't know where to put your large data, if you don't have a source for that, uh, source cooperative is trying to step into that space. You can think of this as GitHub, but for very big data. Um, let's give this a try. So let's see how am I doing? I'm just going to show quickly what's wake up. So here's our here's the, our website. As before, you can see R and Python, but you want to interact with this stuff. So we have a little page on environments and let's interact with it on code spaces. So you can click this. I already have one. So it says you can go ahead and resume that code space. And if you're doing it for the first time, it has to download more stuff. So it'll take maybe a couple minutes. If I'm doing it here, it should be relatively fast. Here you can see this starts to look like a code space environment that's running VS code. If you don't like VS code, you can put, um, if you are more of a Jupyter person, for instance, you can say editor equals Jupyter and it will start it up in a Jupyter notebook. We'll see which one gets started faster. Okay, so it's woken up now, it says hello. And uh, here's that example we were just looking at. And I should be able to just start running these chunks of code interactively in front of you. Live demo, very dangerous. <laughs> and so this is doing that stack search for here, Sentinel-2 saying, give me anything in this bounding box of around San Francisco in these dates uh, in the summer and let's see what it looks like. And you can see we've already been able to load those things, take care of the projection. And I've got the red and near IR bands that we do for that classic NDVI calculation. And in a couple of seconds, we have calculated NDVI. Uh, there you go. For San Francisco, Golden Gate Park shows up really nicely. So super easy. If you'd rather do that in, in Jupyter, you can do that in a Jupyter environment. If you'd rather do that in our studio, you can do that in, in an R studio environment. You know, you can do it locally, you can do it that way, you can do it in your VS code. So it moves around, it goes anywhere. Um, that's kind of the goal. All right, I think I'm around at time. So I'll see if I can pause there and uh, take some questions, see where you wanna go. Thank you, Carl. I'll start again with questions in the room. Question from Cascade online. Cascade, there's a go ahead and unmute. 
Hi, Carl. Thank you so much for this um, presentation. It's really cool to see what you uh, and your collaborators are developing here. Um, I have a question for you about as we create more tools and platforms for folks to access um, large geospatial data sets and use them, uh, especially those without access to high performance computing, how do you teach best practices on data use? So one thing I keep running into, for example, when I review papers with gridded population products is uh, folks are using them incorrectly. Um, they're really easy to pull off Google Earth Engine now. Um, the same thing with climate data sets or building heat indices or even NDVI. Like, how do you, I mean, is that really up to us as faculty and mentors to teach our students that? But how do you teach that, um, you know, across an interdisciplinary uh Cross disciplines to so many people around the world who are now using these kinds of platforms um, where they can access a large amount of data and run analyses on them. Yeah, I love this. It's a, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think there are two parts to the answer. I think one is first kind of chain, going back to my Lego bricks, we need to change what we think of as a scientific product. This is a particular problem in my field. I think we're, we expect science to be done the same way it was done in ancient times almost of building everything yourself. Like you're expected to, to know exactly as an ecologist how to do things that are totally not inside your field just by like reading another paper for it. A paper is not a good Lego brick in, in when you talk about what's the right way to pre-process data, which has come up again and again. Let's create those derivatives correctly, like from the experts that do that. And don't just share that in kind of a dead paper format that like a human would take a long time to digest and reproduce. Like create derivative products and put them somewhere. I think things like source cooperative, or you can host these locally as we do, or getting groups like NASA to host them onto AWS, whatever it is, being able to share our derivative products that are done correctly so we can build on each other's Lego bricks rather than assuming that every student can recreate kind of all of knowledge from scratch. Lacking that though, code can be a pretty good Lego brick too, often much more reproducible than a text-based description of how to do that. And so we're trying to get people to learn patterns that are kind of consistent, concise, adopt best practices and translate everywhere. That helps you kind of as well reuse other practices because it's embedded in the code, not embedded in the data product. And so we're trying to show those two approaches. And I think that's super important. So thanks for raising that. Are there any other questions either in the room or online? Those, the, the code that's being used is Python and R only at this point? Would it any Correct. Of those support in the future? It's a, it's a great it's it's a great question. Um, most of what we are doing uses in order to make them very similar, we often hit the same tools underneath. So we hit GDAL a lot underneath, which is bound to many other languages. For the vector stuff, we hit DuckDB, which has bindings and you know Rust and uh, Jupiter, I mean uh, Julia and many other languages. So I think it's possible to extend to other languages without a big leap, often because they're using the same libraries underneath as well. Uh, like DuckDB, Arrow, and, and GDALT. So I think it's possible, but we are focusing on R and Python as the two languages that most of our community is working in one or the other. Thank you. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. I'm going to share a big picture reflection. Um, I'm happy to have a response from Cascade and I'll probably follow up after this, but um, I think there's, I was talking with someone during the break, um, the user in this conversation is often referring to an analyst who's very upstream from uses in decision making and things that impact people in the real world. Um, and so questions like the ones that was just posed, like, you know, how do we address the misuse of data sets? I, I think we could reframe that as we could also be thinking about how do data scientists get a better picture of what the use, what user data needs are and what use, you know, unmet use cases. Um, because there's there's probably a reason, you know, some of it's just a student who's misusing a data set or a, a, an academic didn't dig deep enough or something, of course, but there's some real use cases that are not being addressed and that um, we could help address it, as data scientists. So I think there's just a uh, maybe a, a bunch of conversation that, is missing here around like what happens after analysts are using and ingesting data and, and it's a bit insular like you know we are each other's users we often have um, this conversation 
but there are users beyond us. And, and I don't think we've talked about that very much yet. Um, and I'm just offering that reflection. Well, I, I love this point. I think it's, I just wanted to say that like, this kind of democratizing these tools so that they can be kind of accessible to anyone and used in ways we don't expect. One place we're seeing that is when working with some tribal partners in which sovereign data is important. And the idea that in order to use these things, they would have to put it onto a cloud platform owned by a commercial company as a non-starter. And so like correct use aside, being able to kind of own the use of these things and being able to run it completely on their own hardware with their own data that never leaves their sovereign territory is an important like and kind of often overlooked aspect of this kind of modularization. So I don't think it's the answer to that, but I think it's kind of a step in that direction. It's just making these things into kind of these modular reusable chunks that we can examine and ask those questions and have other groups challenge us on how, what is the correct use of those things in ways that maybe we haven't thought of. Thank you. Thank you everyone, thank you Carl again. What? Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention to is that we do have a page at the end of the jam board for workshop feedback. You know, feel free to leave it anonymously or post your name if you want, either way. Uh, Alex is going to add a couple of guiding questions to that jam board to kind of help, help funnel feedback. Uh, so if you look at our agenda, you know, it's been, it's been a, a long day, and you know, I'm, I'm thankful for folks who are still engaged and for folks who stay here all day online. Uh, I think that's a testament to how good our speakers were doing. And you know, thanks so much to all the speakers. The last item of business for today is just to report out on our breakout group sessions. Uh, so I'd like to invite Camilla Green up, who was in the, the open science education session to report back on the, the interesting conversation that we had. Thank you, Camilla. So um, in our group, we talked about open science education, and we spent a lot of time talking about the barriers that we face the open science and open science training and education at all of our institutions. Um, a big piece that we talked about is people's willingness to share data or code. Either their data may have cost them a lot of money to collect, or their code, they're worried about people judging them or thinking they're dumb or stealing their ideas. So these are all things that people are considering when they're thinking about whether they want to um, take part in these open science processes. Um, a way that we talked about that we're using in our school project is um, making the OS 101 modules one of the deliverables for all of our project members to complete uh, to ensure that we're all actually doing these trainings. Um, one thing we talked about was that a lot of folks you know, don't want to take time out of their very busy work day to learn a new work method, but they feel that what they're already doing is working for them. So by making this a deliverable for us, we are all forced to take time out of our days and really be mindful about going through these work modules. Um, um, we just talk a lot about some of the funding that we all encounter um, for open science training, but more generally, um, and how time is also a big barrier. Um, we talked about some of the barriers to learning about computing education and how uh, an introductory level coding class might be actually full of people who are very familiar with coding and so that's not a very good environment for true beginners to learn and not a good place for people to feel like they can ask their dumb questions um which might cause people to just drop out entirely and, and decide they want to focus on making help which means that we're losing valuable mm -hmm. um, um, the need for uh, institutions to take into account open science when determining tenure or other sorts of promotions, um, so that these are open scientists uh, taught to both early career professionals, but also those who may be more unwilling to change their practices or incorporate new ideas. All right, thanks, Camilla. So, is there anyone in the group there that wants to add anything else? I think it's a great summary. All right, thanks so much, Camilla.
it's one from the ethical consideration through that, like the report now. Three years graciously, uh, thoughtful. yeah, I think with the owl, you don't have to. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, okay, uh, we had a really awesome discussion, uh, in our room. I'm glad that these were recorded, uh, so that I can kind of go back and creep on the other <laughs> sessions. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so we talked about a few, we talked about a lot of things. One of the main things was that this and equity. <laughs> Access and equity are not the same thing. Oh, yeah, access and openness. So, like, there's a paradigm between whether it can, whether something can be accessed or whether it can be open. And it's, you don't always get to have something that is accessible and open at the same time based on different people's back, backgrounds and circumstances. Um, we talked a lot about um, involving people from the ground up and kind of understanding what different individuals from communities are kind of looking for and involving them in the beginning, from the beginning and then trying to facilitate that as a group through, through time and uh, like through a theory of change. And um, one thing that I thought, one thing I really liked that we talked about was how like if we were going to imagine um, like some of the best things that we could hope for, like outcomes of open science, like best case scenario, what comes out of all this. Um, I guess one thing that we said was to reshuffle priorities based on people that aren't just us. So like letting other people's priorities, like empowering people to pursue and take action on their personal priorities. Um, or their priorities for their community. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting way of um, thinking about, well, I guess I just hadn't thought about like, what do we really want? Yeah, we want open science, but like why? Uh, maybe one answer is to say like, it would be cooler if other people's priorities were also part of the conversation and not just not just to select few people's priorities. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so sounds like there's another great discussion. Uh, so part of that's the climate and societal the impacts group. Is there someone who is willing to report back on that? All right, uh, I'll get like other two chat in as well. That's it. We feel it out on the screen. That's your jam board. This is um, so we had three really excellent presentations. One by uh, Owner Hoffman, who is um, joined us from Vienna, you may know. Uh, Viasa doing a lot of work on climate migration. And he gave several different examples of uh, work that they've done integrating data from climate and migration related. Uh, uh, data sets from icons and um, he came up with this sort of list of key lessons learned um, where um, I'm not going to drill down into these too much but there was a very helpful kind of set of main concerns and then Jaffer also presented work that he's done about fertility and migration in Bangladesh uh, and brought up some of the concerns he had. One topic that came out of Jaffer's presentation is Sort of what about open science might make um, uh, the data more actionable or more readily taken up by decision makers uh, or used for adaptation planning or that kind of thing? Is there some connection there? Or can traditional science do that just as well? And so we had some discussion around that. Um, and um, oh, what is that? Um, so we we thought that you know one topic came up that Tom mentioned is that there's a lot of companies now very active in this space that are sort of 
for being purveyors to the private sector of kind of information. And most of that data is under lock and key. You could pay a very high price to get it if you want it, but you know, you have to have that ability to pay. Um, so open science can actually be really helpful for uh, broader societal needs. Um, there's a question about whether uh, open, science, open science can um, avoid the issue of politicians blaming everything on climate when it's really other issues. And we kind of brought up the fact that if you publish results that show that other things are more important than climate and affecting outcome X or Y or Z, conflict, migration, you name it, um, then that actually may help to sort of rebuff, you know, their underlying societal conditions, um, their political economy factors, power relations, and other things that may be just much more important. And that open science can help to unmask some of those and or unmask the sort of myth out there. Uh, you know, Mike Hume has a great paper called The Future is Not Climate, right? Um, you know, the future is going to be messy, it's going to be complicated, but it's not all boiled down to climate change. Um, so there were some questions about data access uh, and what, where we get our expertise as a largely social science crowd here. I'm not saying everybody here is social scientists, but how do you learn where to go to get the best climate data and what are some of the issues with educating yourself or relying on really good third, you know, climate science experts to guide you and maybe some thoughts about, well, could there be a platform eventually that allows people to do some assess you know, compare, assess, and exchange notes on what the most appropriate data are for different uses. Because let's face it, the variety of climate data, both historical and projected uh, in the volumes of those data are quite asking, quite overwhelming in many cases. So how do you actually boil down? And what Tom made a good observation that basically people tend to use what's easiest, closest to hand, and if they can quickly integrate it into their model, that doesn't necessarily mean they could be good data or they may not be so good, um, depending on what you're measuring. And, and, uh, so he gave some examples of ways in which they've had to assess and really drill deep into the literature to find what, what data sets to use. The same basic issue arises socioeconomic data and a variety of socioeconomic data that are out there. Population grids, we've created pop grid. You've probably heard of that term a couple of times, popgrid.org. It's a way of kind of learning about the different gridded population products out there. But even we have trouble keeping on top of the most recent releases and all the new um, bells and whistles that people are putting into their data sets. So that, that's kind of subject now. Dana is going to lead some new work where we hope to up, update those, those uh, sort of the documentation around the data. Um, and then Jafar raised a very important point that there is an inequity and actually, Nancy Searby also was very helpful in bringing up the fact that we talk a lot about open data and open science, but the funding to do this kind of science is not equitably distributed around the world. The bandwidth uh, and the ability to access data sets, uh, although there are some real advantages to cloud compute if you are in a low income country because you're not moving all those data and trying to download them to your local uh, computer if you if you know how to how to implement the code. In the cloud, it can really save you a lot of bandwidth and you just get the results that you need at the end. Um, and then there's a lot of, we have a lot of discussion around how open science can facilitate engagement with stakeholders. And, um, you know, um, one question that I asked was at the AGU, there was a very impassioned presentation by uh, a woman of color from California said, I really don't want to see one more study on how greenness varies by some level in the cities around or access, uh, you know, impacts of extreme. Heat. We know that already. We know these are their natural leaves. What are we going to do about them now? So I think this is something that we as open scientists need to take on board. And one thing Kip's going to be involved with with Rob Quick here is basically doing a, a uh, workshop this summer where we're going to bring EJ researchers and uh, NGOs and others together to learn about open science principles and how to you know do the run the code themselves and do their own analyses. Um, so uh, I think that there's there was some other discussion around you know the fact that when all these communities start 
clamoring for change, there's going to be pushback too. <laughs> and some of the political winds that now favor open science could blow the other way and sort of you know, be pushing back against some of the things that we are seeking to do. I think I'll stop there, but there was a really rich discussion and I want to thank everybody who was members of this um, breakout to who contributed. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so with that, I would just like to open the room if there's any final comments. Uh, strong line participants do agree, go ahead. Uh, you guys nailed it. Like, thanks for putting this together. This is really awesome. And I appreciate all the thought and work that's gone into making this day happen. And I think it's really refreshing and awesome. So just thanks a lot. Any other comments online? <laughs> I mean, that, that could be a mic drop comment. No, I, I, it's not quite a mic drop. I like mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> what we do want to know, and this is an added question I put Oh, Dave Jeff, has one. And, and as soon as I'm done, Dave, you can speak. Um, is that we do want to know what you would think would be useful segues to this. If we want to do another, you know, like this in a year, say a year's time. Is there some subtopic that you know we were able to get everything kind of on a very superficial level today, but there's something that we want to drill deeper into? Then you should note those in the uh, jam board or you can bring them up now. Dave, over to you. Thanks, Alex. So I, I, I was just um, going to say that I, I think that in future workshops, that um, real practitioners, those who, who connect, with those decision makers, those who are trying to get more data out into the public so they can use uh, data more effectively and efficiently uh, should be a part of this because we've just seen all too often, uh, you know, the choir preaching to the choir, you know, and uh, the meetings end and everybody says this has been a great success. And in many cases, it has been from a research standpoint and things like that. Uh, but if we really want open science to reach its potential, uh, we have to move and move quickly to not only capture the uh, rapid change in climate and the impacts it's having, uh, but also putting data to work to enable people to make better decisions. And that, I think, should be a real focus of um, what we do in the future. Thanks. Uh, yes, I would say um, glad to see some of the national uh, people. But, uh, this morning you mentioned you may have some follow up uh, meetings or um, uh, walk up and I get bothered with the national engagement. Uh, encourage, I'd say, especially in the context of climate change. Thank you. Any other final words? Okay, then. Uh... Thanks again, everyone, for coming out here and bra braving this climate weirding weather that we get now in the rain in the middle of January. Uh, and I know some of you tra traveled quite far to be here. Uh, and thanks so much for online participants for you know st sticking it out all day. Uh, so we'll be following up, you know, by email. We'll you know we'll get these meeting artifacts up on Zenodo and share them out with everyone. The jam board will remain open if you want to provide any additional ideas or feedback. Uh, so please don't hesitate to do that. And with that, we can we can end the meeting. So thanks again, everyone.